I don't know if you know this, there is a subculture of uh, insane cranks on the internet who believe on that- On the internet, you say? Yes. No way. <laughs> who believe that you should stare at the sun oh. every single day. It, are for these, your health. Is this the same thing as like eating raw meat? Yeah, yeah, it definitely crosses over. It might even be some of those exact Oh, same it's like a influences. keto adjacent yeah. diet. <laughs> <laughs> I've been um, getting a bunch of shit on, I have a, a burner TikTok account that I use to follow like weird guys and conspiracy oh, sure, theories. Sure. Mm-hmm, those mm-hmm. guys are going to ham about the eclipse right they now. They are going nuts. Apparently there's a bunch of towns that the eclipse is covering that are named Nineveh. But hey, it's also hey, that's, that... Nineveh, that's Nineveh, that's Nineveh, my business. Mm. <laughs> that's <laughs> Nineveh, my business. <laughs> so many possible worlds but we got this one so many possible worlds but we got this one welcome to the worst of all possible worlds the first and only podcast that's none of a business oh, i'm the worst of all possible aj <laughs> i'm the worst of all possible brian and i'm the worst of all possible Josh's. and uh yeah joining us this week we have a very exciting and special guest uh, coming live from the worst of all possible world studio. Yeah, coming coming live from the boat. Yes, the, uh, she is a fantastic stand-up comedian and actor. Uh, she splits her time between Tokyo and New York, and she is closing in as we speak on half a million followers on TikTok. Yes. Oh, goodness gracious! You can follow her at Baby Pink House. Uh, <laughs> spelled exactly the way Josh just That's pronounced right. it. Truly, truly. House. <laughs> and, House. and she uh, is, well, it, you might remember her if you're a longtime listener from the episode we did about 24, all yeah. the way back in August of 2022. Uh, please welcome to the show, Yurie Collins. Thank you so much for having me. Yay, yeah, 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 yeah. Yay, I'm so excited. Do you have any eclipse plans? Uh, you know, just like survive. <laughs> <laughs> Make it through the weekend. I feel like. Right. Is are there other? No, I, I, no I, I, uh, <laughs> that just really. I, I, I honestly think survive that, the eclipse. Yeah, yeah, no, I just feel like for that brief moment, it passes the sun and everyone turns into werewolves. Right, 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 right. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, can't get much worse than this. Yeah, so true. true. You're not maybe Manhattan that's is going need. to face uh, a whole lady hawk situation. The time has come to focus in on today's topic, which is buried child, the play by Sam Shepard, and uh, yeah, you're a when. When we were talking about you coming back on the show again, mm-hmm. you had experience with Sam Shepard, the playwright, his work. And when you saw it on the list, you're like, oh, I would love to come on and talk about that. First of all, I went to acting school. I went to Ooh. four years of <laughs> college. I'm quoting college. <laughs> it was just expensive daycare for young adults. But uh, <laughs> I grew up in Japan, graduated high school in Japan and then started college in the U.S. And I knew I wanted to get like an artsy education just to balance the lack of any sort of arts in my public school education in Japan. Mm. I applied to Emerson College's acting program and they kept telling me, oh, your application is incomplete unless you do this audition. You have to do a monologue. And I was like, a mono? What? Like, I didn't know what that was. (laughs) I never did theater. Sure. So I was like, dad what do I do because he's the American one in the house (laughs) and he was like oh you know what let me call my college ex-girlfriend and I was like well I thought we were talking about me (laughs) and he was like no 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 like she was a dramaturg major and she will help us find a monologue so he called her and my mom really likes her. So nothing weird there. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, she was like, yes, call she Beth. moved in a few yeah. weeks later. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She's new mom. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so he called her and she directed a bunch of Sam Shepard plays in her college days. So she sent me this monologue from a short play called Icarus's mother. Mm-hmm. And oh, sure. there's a mon- she was like, there's a monologue in there where this girl is talking about the 4th of July fireworks. And I think that'll be great for you. I was like, okay, I have no idea what's going on. So I just got the play. Yeah, you were telling me she sent you like an actual like fucking stack of papers in the mail, right? Like international shipping from the US to Japan in a fucking envelope. No, what I said to you was... Well, this was 2007, and you were like, they had PDFs. <laughs> they did, <right? laughs> Famously. It's not that long but ago. it's tactile. You got to have the thing in your hand. Yeah, so yeah. she sent me the book, and I just practiced in front of a mirror, never showed anyone oh, until wow. the admission. Wow. <laughs> um, and, yeah, I just tried to 
make it sound as natural as possible. And I think it was a good introduction for me because, well, we can talk about later how maybe it's not realism, but at least the style of how people talked sounded more like, okay, closer to reality. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, Mm -hmm. you know, some kind of obscure way of presenting text. So um, I think that was like a nice segue for me. And then, yeah, and then I went to college and I was like, oh, wow, this guy is a big deal. (laughs) (laughs) And so hot and just so so unbelievably attractive. Uh, We have talked about Sam Shepard once before on this podcast, but not in his capacity as a writer. Oh, right. But in his capacity as an actor, we covered uh, Ethan Hawke's Hamlet. Mm. Yeah. Uh, That was, I think, our eighth episode. So like that. Long, long time ago. And he was the ghost. Yeah. And he was like one. I think he's probably the best performance in that whole movie. Yeah. Uh, as the ghost. And I think a lot of people, if you know Sam Shepard, you know him for his acting. Yeah. Not for Hamlet, probably. Probably but not no. for Hamlet. But most specifically, especially for the boomers in our audience, you know him because of the right stuff mm-hmm. or the people raised by boomers. <laughs> right, right, right. Because sure, sure, sure. my dad is a huge aviation and space program guy. Oh, I was saying sure. before we recorded. He actually has a model of he has two models of the X1. One of them was signed by Chuck Yeager. That's like how he spent the last 10 years of his life was just like signing little X1 models and mailing them out. So they were very expensive. Um, My dad has all kinds of memorabilia. So he loved the right stuff. I remember I think that was one of those movies that came on two tapes initially. Oh, yeah, it was (laughs) like the sound of music. Yep. Yeah. So we we had the two tapes of the right stuff. And I, I wasn't familiar with his like name. And then there was a point in college where for some reason there was one cohort in a directing class that all did Sam Shepard plays. And I was wor- I was acting in one of them and I was talking to my parents on the phone or whatever. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm doing this like Sam Shepard play. They're like, oh, Sam Shepard, the guy who played Chuck Yeager. <laughs> <laughs> household name and that and that bridge the gap it was yeah. like <laughs> sam shepard considered himself mostly a writer like uh, because he sort of reached notoriety uh, because of his acting i feel like he kind of had to double down and just keep reminding people i write plays yeah and boy howdy did he. he's like alan wake he's just like i'm sam i'm sam shepard well, you know I'm a writer <laughs> you know what he's like brian what is he like he's like our own aj diddy a very talented oh, and yeah. handsome actor oh i am not <laughs> i wish i was hot as Sam Shepard. Also, Holy shit. I don't think Sam Shepard is hot. You I, I just really? hot. I'm just gonna say it right now. Pillory wow. me if you if you wish. Pillory me if you don't wish. Uh, I'll pillory you with his pillowy lips. Come on. Hey, I don't think you understand what the word pillory <laughs> means. I don't. I don't. Um, but I, I don't think Sam Shepard's that hot. It's fine. It's fine. Okay, so we've got just we've throwing got, that out there. We've got one AJ <laughs> in the certainly. Sam Shepard is hot column. We've got okay. Brian in the, in the anti. I'm neutral. What do you think, Yuri? You're the tiebreaker here. Oh, he's oh, hot. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Sam Shepard officially hot. The, you, the troubled writer. You saw like, him in person, right? Yes. Yeah, so my first job in New York City, uh, I waitressed at this restaurant that's no longer there, but it was on the corner of 21st and 6th. Mm. And yeah, rest he would in peace come in. every restaurant yeah. in New York. <laughs> <laughs> R.I.P. Yeah, he used to sit at the bar, not like all the time, but he would come in every once in a while. Okay. And yeah, just looked like he had a lot on his mind and quietly drank and wrote. And I wish I said something to him like, yeah. oh my God, I did your monologue in <laughs> college. I'm sure you would have loved to hear that. But no, yeah, he probably would have been like, did he have sort of that like brusque air about him? Did he have sort of that like cowboy energy? Yes, absolutely. I, I could just like see it from so far away. And I feel like uh, with your father's um, obsession, uh, Brian, like it's the same as my father as well. It's like his Roman Empire with like, <laughs> Chuck Baker. Because I could see, I could sense just how he revered <laughs> this man. And I'm like, this is kind of... Um, homoerotic you know I'm, all, I'm here for it i'm like good for you dad yeah yeah oh, yeah. yeah 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 i mean I, I you were telling us before we recorded that when he came out of the sea in the right stuff that like is a very important it's moment. very important yeah. so let me say it because he comes out of the ocean uh out of this burning plane that he just flew mm. <laughs> yes and <laughs> someone is like looking from far away from the shore like what is that is that a man and someone else realizes it's chuck yeager and goes you're damn right it is. And my dad, I swear, <laughs> sheds a tear every time. <laughs> it's very cute. Well, it's awesome. so funny, too, because Sam Shepard has had a terrible fear of flying. 
Oh, he like, really? did not fucking fly because of some bad incident on a plane. That, that's what inspired the, the Mexico, Icarus yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. And Chuck Yeager actually got him up in the cockpit and like flew. He flew with Chuck Yeager, which I'm sure just made him even more terrified. Yeah, it's like, no, 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 thanks. <laughs> no, not, not for me. Uh, I, I discovered Sam Shepard in high school. It was one of those things that like. I would browse the play section at Barnes and Noble and Mm -hmm. they had the I think what is sort of a staple of pretty much any acting students or anyone interested in theaters uh, bookshelf, which is the seven plays by Samuel Shepard. Yeah, is currently holding it and waving it around like a maniac. I'm also stroking his face. Stop. (laughs) Just Um, stop. (laughs) Stop. He's dead. What's he going to do? That's cool. Uh, Let me just. just, Yeah. Thank you. For a defense of necrophilia. Yet another. Yet another. (laughs) That's a Sam Shepard staple. I would love that. He would be so proud. He'd be so proud. Of, thank you, Uri. <laughs> Sam Shepard would be proud of me. Uh, so in the Seven Plays co- Collection, we have uh, Buried Child, Curse of the Starving Class, The Tooth of Crime, La Turista, Tongues, Savage Love, and True West. And some of those plays are good. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and so True West was sort of the obsession because I was in high school around the time that Philip Seymour Hoffman and John C. Riley did their oh, yeah. Broadway production. Right. Where they're, did you see it? I did not. They flipped no. back and forth, right? They did. They played the two brothers, and yeah. I think every other night they would alternate uh, which brother they were playing. Jesus, what a pair of people to see together on a stage. Yeah, Christ. I also did that in high school. My uh, my buddy Tyler and I did True True West, a scene from it where we switched roles. We memorized both, and then we switched roles as our presentation. Uh, and it was some of the most fun I've ever had. I think True West is probably my favorite Sam Shepard play. I think it's the one that I think is most fully realized for me, for him, mm. uh, because he is actually very hit or miss, but that's because he wrote 65 plays wow. in his life. The, is, is that... Is that all of them or is that just the long subjects? Because there's also there's so many short. Plays. Yeah, because so that's like, also like the short. his mother that it would be included in that 65. Uh, yeah. I'm not exactly sure. I know that like there it depends on how you want to count them because sure. some people like combine plays together. So the exact number isn't there. But like there was a point where he was just cranking out play after play after play after play. And that was during his time at La Mama. Uh, but let's let's backtrack a little bit. Let's go back. Oh, the way back oh. 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 To, to the very beginning, uh, to 1943, when Sam Shepard uh, all the way back okay. was, was born as uh, Samuel Shepard Rogers, the third. I'm sorry. His name is Sam Rogers. Well, here's the thing. His nickname, not as sexy, not, not as sexy but his nickname was Steve Rogers, which is what? the name of <laughs> America, uh, which is the name of Captain America, God which damn. I think is pretty on the nose myself. But wow. uh, uh, his dad was an Air Force pilot, so he was an army brat. He, he traveled all over. He lived in a bunch of Air Force places. brat. Yeah, he was an Air Force brat. I'm sorry. Oh man, I'm gonna get did the he, army wait, mad at so me. I can't get them mad at me again. They know he, where I live. Uh, did he ever live in Albuquerque? Do you know? Because uh, there's an Air Force base there, and did, he uh, talks about New Mexico so much. Well, he lived in New Mexico for a while, okay. I think, and then spent t- time between there and his ranch in Kentucky in his later life. I know. Oh, Kentucky, uh, interesting. Yeah. So he did. So he. What is, is he, Lou Wallace? Uh, he's no. kind, He's kind of Americana <laughs> incarnate, right, in yeah. terms of his life story. But he eventually settled. He and his family settled in Southern California, specifically Duarte, which is a little bit outside Los Angeles. Okay. It's, it's like a farm he he was on an avocado farm specifically oh but wow like, we are in like sort of the bakersfield sort of area of california where it's almost central california he he talks a lot about just just a, a cesspool of, of scum and villainy out in bakersfield <laughs> yeah. uh, really? where dreams it's, go to it's die it's never changed it's always it been has this. remained the same for as much as like shepherd himself is like that that area and that type of california is completely gone now I mean, it's still around. Like, you just like kind of got demographics go have it. changed, but the 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 character of Bakersfield as hell on earth has never shifted. Well, and I wanted to sort of take a moment to point that thing up specifically about like whether you're talking about Bakersfield or or uh, Illinois, which is where he was actually born. The Bakersfield right. of states. That's right, Brian. <laughs> he he has this <laughs> holy shit. He has this real interest in like the parts of America that are otherwise overlooked. Yeah. Uh, oh, that, sure. that it's like, this is, I don't know, you want to call it the fucking real America or whatever. It was giving Rust Belt. Yeah. yeah. Um, and <laughs> I didn't know about any of that. <laughs> um, it's serving belt. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, there was many, 
uh, aspects of, well, Icarus's mother, it's a one act. So mm -hmm. I don't know if it counts as one play. Right. 65 plays is crazy. I don't know if I've made 65 TikToks. <laughs> 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 That's... And you have an infinitely bigger audience than most of Sam Shepard's plays. Uh, you know, everything is just wrong, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is, I'm so not impressed by me. Uh, but no, uh, <laughs> Well, so, well, we are. Yeah, we, we are. are. We're so happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're Thank so you happy, so much. Yeah. I'm so happy. Yeah, and if podcasters <laughs> like you, then... But then, then the sky's the limit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm really, it means a lot to me because I feel like usually podcast guys, not to call you guys podcast mm. guys. Oh, no, we, we are. That's fine. Podcast yeah. guys, I feel like generally don't really like me. It's like when I do stand up, like mm. if straight men are laughing at my jokes, like I'm like, Good for you guys. <laughs> Yay. You're ahead of the curve. Yeah, let's Little do gold it. Star. Yeah, yeah. Because usually I like hurt their feelings. But just quickly, I do have to say that when I first started stand up, most of my jokes were about like making fun of like straight guys. Mm -hmm. But through stand up comedy, I've made so many great straight male friends. So it's been very healing. <laughs> So to any ladies out there <laughs> listening, um, just get on stage yeah. and uh, face your fears. Uh -huh. Yeah, straight but... men in comedy will never lead you down the wrong path. I was going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. only <laughs> good guys. Salt of the earth, really. Uh... Met some great guys, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, my mom was like, don't you meet guys doing stand up? Like, why don't you like, why don't you have a boyfriend? Basically, I was like, I don't want to date a comic. Like, yeah. No, oh, God, God, no. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, back to Sam Shepard. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I so in Japan, my education was very like we memorized facts. We mm -hmm. rarely talked about our opinions and uh, had discussions <laughs> like none of that happened. No, 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 no. Like, mm. I remember when we learned about the Renaissance period, um, we, there was just like a list of the artwork and the person who made that work of art and it was mm. just we just to memorize it without ever looking at like what is this is this a painting a sculpture a church right. i don't know hmm. oh wow doesn't matter yeah just memorizing and so when i went to emerson college a super artsy like liberal school in boston mm. i remember so i read more sam shepherd plays freshman year my first semester uh in this like you know theater class whatever in first day of class the teacher like sat on her desk like cross-legged, like cool teacher style. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, hell yeah, <laughs> I'm not dude. like the other teachers. Yeah. I'm the cool teacher. Very yeah. much. And I gasped. I was like, oh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> was not ready for that. That's not the sitting? <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh my God, you know? And then I didn't have anything to say in class because I've never been asked, like, what do you think? Mm. And then, yeah, we would read a play and everyone just had so many opinions and Reading Buried Child again this time, um, one of the themes I thought was recurring was about like this unfulfilled potential, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. through the corn and like even like Vince's music career and stuff like that. There's all this sure, like yeah. potential that's not met. And I feel like it's bumming everyone out. And, uh, uh, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> and so I felt this like, wow, in that classroom, Everyone has like this different kind of pressure. In Japan, I felt like the pressure was to not stand out, just to mm. stay the course, stay in line. But in this like liberal arts theater class where we we're talking about Sam Shepard plays, everyone was just, they had so many opinions or <laughs> not necessarily actually. They would just talk to say things. Right, and I was yeah. like, this is different. Yeah. Uh, that, that sounds like theater school to me. That's yeah. also yeah. kind of what we do on this show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, <laughs> something resembling a living. Uh, yeah. Excuse me. I have a communications degree from Hell John yeah. Calvin University. <laughs> Let's go. A very yes. real, a very real university that exists. A very real uh, program, <laughs> a very right. real school. Yeah. Well, we talk about sort of uh, <laughs> this unfulfilled potential, and we mm -hmm. kind of see that pretty much early on in Sam Shepard's life because, right. you know, he goes to college for uh, agriculture and then immediately oh. drops oh. out uh, because, you know, he grew up on a farm. Many so such he he cases. Yeah. Uh, he, he immediately drops out and joins a repertory company, uh, which is a thing you could do in the 60s. <laughs> Uh, a traveling a repertory oh. company? What's that? Uh, yeah, I know. It's I mean, it's wild. Actually, that might be something a lot of our listeners probably don't know what that oh, is. Oh, sure. Genuinely. Okay. So it's uh, uh, the basic. If you're European, you kind of do. But right. yeah, yeah. Uh, the basic idea is that uh, you have a, com a company of actors and uh, you uh, learn a couple plays and you perform them in rep with each other. Yeah. So like alternating every other night, you do a different play. Usually pa you pair plays together uh, and then perform them in front of a, a new town every night. You pack up your set, you move on. It's sort of like... Yeah. Like a very like medieval 
yeah, set up yeah, yeah. in terms of like how it's constructed. And uh, he does this for about two years and then finally moves to New York City in 1963. Uh, and he starts doing what anyone does when they move to New York in the early 60s or honestly today is rent you start an apartment. doing rent an apartment <laughs> and you for start $5 a month $5 right. a month uh, you, you bite a nickel and hand it to your landlord <laughs> right, and that covers right, right. it uh, but then you also start doing theater with everyone that you're working in the food industry with so mm-hmm. you so he starts uh, doing theater at St. Mark's Church in the Bowery oh, which wow, is okay. uh, like basically a little basement space and then finally at La Mama <laughs> which is still running which to is this day. brand new at this, this time this is brand oh, new because that okay. was founded in what 1961 for those who aren't aware la mama is like a very like they're the original off off broadway company in yeah they were very... founded by the baby dinosaur from dinosaurs mm. and no. to him yes. there were yes. only two kinds of theaters there was no. la mama no. and no. not la mama no. <laughs> yeah. not la founded mama by a crazy. woman named ellen stewart who yes. was largely who was a fashion designer yeah oh, i'm so glad you didn't well, you say gotta fascist. love her because she's <laughs> <laughs> No, she was not a fascist. That's she was the very thing. much not a fascist. She was the opposite of a fascist. And yeah. then I think La Mama's sort I of... I work in the fascist industry. <laughs> the, their, whole, their whole aesthetic, La Mama, and like sort of what they have always sought to do is to provide a truly egalitarian space where all sorts of uh, new work can be created. N- yeah. Genuinely, like when people talk about downtown theaters being like weird stuff that's yeah. mostly not fucking true at all. Right. <laughs> I've seen plenty of downtown theater. I know it's... Oftentimes it's just kind of community theater level stuff. Yeah. But La Mama is where you really do see the weird mm-hmm. shit every yes. fucking yeah. every fucking oh, season. I love that. So romantic. It's yeah. like Jonathan yeah. Larson's New York City in right. rent yeah. or something. Like, uh-huh. oh, artists downtown. Well, and we we met Yuri doing downtown theater. That's at true. The theater that we will never name on this podcast, which right. we have mentioned many, many times. I was just listening to like a really old episode of the show, and I totally fucking mentioned it. <laughs> How, <laughs> How dare, dare you? How How dare dare you? Comment if you can find it uh. but but uh but we we were talking about how like yeah it was we met because you were doing like one of those plays that play is a stretch was it yeah. By, yeah. was it was it written by maybe perhaps ar slash pete no Bernie? no it was it <laughs> no. was something even stupider than that but <laughs> yeah just like we so many memories of what this space what this kind of like way of being is like, you know, yeah, yeah, I, I have a lot of them. We mentioned this before, but like the key to Sam Shepard's career is just that he was a very prolific writer and mm-hmm. then he could write fast. And the thing mm-hmm. about having La Mama was that he could just throw shit up on stage because he had this space whenever he had finished a play. Right. So you get stuff like his early work, like the rock garden, which is almost unreadable, but it was, <laughs> it was thrown up. It was able to be performed in front of an audience yeah. and he starts building momentum this way. Right. Uh, Instead of writing a play that takes eight years and is just like read right around a table in a conference room. Right. And, and that's then like finally, the peak of its, yeah. finally you get a production, which means people read it on music stands that's on right. a stage. That's right. For right, one right. night only. At the public theater. Yeah. Do we dare? Do we Do dare? We? Do we <laughs> dare? Uh, uh, Sam Shepard uh, did an interview with The Guardian, and he was kind of cagey about giving interviews. And then uh, you feel he's sort of like a, 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 he's more talkative than him, but sort of like Cormac McCarthy, I feel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. very much in similar vibe, too. Yeah. But like later on in his life, Sam Shepard was talking to everyone. Don't let, don't let <laughs> there's <laughs> interviews with him all over the goddamn place. But uh, he <laughs> says in an interview with The Guardian that back then there was a dearth of American theater. There was nothing going on American art was starving and he was the one who was going to feed it until it was full American how full? theater how full would it get well American theater will think that it's, mm. it's full but it can yeah. always have one more play it can mm. always eat another bite mm. uh, yeah. and it was during this prolific period that he met Patty Smith if you want a very lovely detailing of their time together read M train which is Patty Smith's memoir about the early days of her living in New York City in the 1960s it was a very tumultuous relationship uh, there was a, an affair happening within it Um, But it led to this very lifelong friendship. She ended up writing his obituary in The New Yorker Mm. uh, when he died. And it's beautiful and moving because she is in in her own right a beautiful writer. And she collaborated with Sam Shepard on a play called Cowboy Mouth. Those are the two subjects that he would write about for the rest of his life. life. Cowboys and mouths. (laughs) And the things that come out of them. Or into Uh, them. 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 (laughs) them. Uh, After the premiere of Cowboy Mouth, uh, uh, they were like, hey, where's Sam? And he had disappeared. Hmm. He had uh, fled off to New England, and this would be a common theme with him, that when the going got tough, Sam Shepard would run 
the fuck away, <laughs> which might come up perhaps in this episode ah. about Barry Child and his own feelings about oh reckoning God. with that. Why didn't they work out? Patty Smith and him seems like a good couple. Yeah, it did. It did. Well, I think he he then uh, she was a Capricorn. I'm looking it up. Right now. <laughs> there it is. There it is. There it is. Capricorn and Scorpio usually. I feel is like, that supposed to work? I feel like it will. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's sort of like Sam Shepard sort of followed a trajectory of Arthur Miller in that he mm. he slept with sort of like the pinnacle artists of 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 their day, mm-hmm. basically. Um, you know, his career starts taking off more and more, and he winds up uh, in San Francisco in 1975 as the playwright in residence of the Magic Theater, where he writes for my money his three best plays, which are True West, Curse of the Starving Class, and of course Buried Child in 1979. And Buried Child wins the Pulitzer Prize. Wow, I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it's his one and only win. I know nothing about Sam. I, I really need to make it clear that like going sure. into this episode, I was like. I, he's out there. I know Mark Marin really likes him. Well, I was going to yeah. say, were you excited when you got to a certain page and you did the New Mexico mentioned <laughs> meme? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he talks about it, he talks about it a lot because New Mexico to him is sort of like the old west sort mm-hmm. of well, uh, and, and and buried child takes place in Illinois and New Mexico, and and there are characters who talk about going to New Mexico, and those are both states that Sam Shepard got arrested for drunk driving in. Oh, okay. Many right. years later, but still. Yeah. Places he likes to do DUIs in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It is it is funny that the unspecified business in New Mexico trouble in New Mexico then becomes real trouble yeah, in New yeah. Mexico <laughs> for him later on. So Sam Shepard has a very long career. He he acts a lot more in his older age. Uh I think one of his final film roles was uh playing the Patriarch in August Osage County, mm-hmm. which obviously takes a lot of inspiration from Buried Child uh in its construction and its sort of deconstruction of the family drama mm-hmm. and uh sam shepherd dies of als related complications in 2017 and this is this was the program note in cowboy mouth mm. uh which again he ran away from after it opened first off let me tell you that i don't want to be a playwright i want to be a rock and roll star i want that <laughs> understood right off okay i got into Thanks, writing sam. plays because i had nothing else to do so I started riding to keep from going off the deep end. That Your was age back just did in an eye roll that can shatter the sun. Writing has become a habit. I like to yodel and dance and fuck a lot. Come on, Writing man. is neat because you do it on a very physical Hold level, on. just like Hold rock on. and roll. Yodel? <laughs> Pause. <laughs> Here's yep. all the normal rock star stuff and yodeling. Yep. Uh, a lot of people think playwrights are some special brand of intellectual fruitcake with the special answers to special oh, problems Lord. that confront the world at large. <laughs> I think that's a crock of shit. Okay. When you write a play, you work out like a musician or on a piece of music. You find all the rhymes and the melody and the harmonies and take them as they come. So much for theory. Okay, sounds really annoying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm starting to see my fundamental disconnect with most of his writings. See, yeah, I think he sounds cool. He's dealing so much with masculinity, yeah, and yeah, I yeah. think that he does come down on the side of it's actually kind of bad, really, that we're chasing all this, and it's but just a nightmare. But he performs it anyway. But That's he the sure thing. does. But he really tried for most of his life to perform it's, it's the compulsion. Marlboro Man. It's yeah, compulsion. Yeah, yeah. Like he's not. He doesn't want to try that. It's just that he has a lot of. Uh, self-destructive impulses Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and he can't escape them much like every single character he's ever written yes (laughs) you know what this statement reminds me of johnny depp talks like this because i used to have a huge crush on johnny depp yeah and he would be like oh you know i'm uh, acting i don't care about acting you know (laughs) i wanted to be a musician uh whatever and it's like all right shut up like you're in pirates of the caribbean you're in (laughs) chocolat whatever that whenever that interview was filmed but i was just like this is so annoying in order to be like one of the greats do you have to act like you never wanted to do this like oh I don't know. Yeah. It's just not me. Don't that's, make me right. Yeah, that's what he's <laughs> saying. So I don't know. They're both kind of, I feel like Giant Up is also self destructive. Um, what? <laughs> my Johnny? Donald? Donald? Not Depp? Donald. Yeah. Child. Well, and, and you had mentioned to me as well, Yuri, about like a certain kind of guy, I guess, who is drawn maybe to Sam Shepard's writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, and how maybe that kind of guy tends to be. Somebody who also wants to be like the tortured artist or the guy who oh, wants I, to be the cool guy. I drink too much, but like that's because I'm just so tortured by how good my art is yes. or whatever. I, I felt that aura at the 
restaurant I worked at. You mm. know, he just looked, he was giving the aura of like, you can't bother me. Like the something is speaking to my pen right now. <laughs> kind of vibe. It flows through me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I do have a story. Um, I went to college and then I moved to New York City to become a famous actress. Um, mm. You know. Stay tuned. <laughs> uh, yes. That's why you're on the podcast. Yes. Because, yeah. you know, reach and exposure and yes. things of that nature. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. Um, and We're writing your coattails, Urie. Let us be very <laughs> clear about this. <laughs> you guys. Um, <laughs> please. So I went to acting school in New York City. I had this uh, great acting teacher and we did like scene study and all kinds of stuff in like a group class setting. And there was this uh, actor that joined the class. I had already been in class for a few months at this point. And this actor from Ireland uh, moved to the city. He joined the class and he kind of like took the class by storm. He was like doing so many monologues, lots of scene work. And it's all voluntary. You have to like do it yourself, mm-hmm. uh, sign up to do the work. Sure. And um, he was just doing so much, you know, right away clearly very talented serious actor Mm. um and then he approached me he was like do you want to do this scene from uh fool for love and i was like oh word yeah sam shepherd i'll do it so we would meet for rehearsal you know carve out time to rent spaces and stuff at like the producers club absolutely (laughs) oh god (laughs) you know i was really alive um and so don't sit on those seats they will shatter shatter. (laughs) as long as you don't sit it's fine but enjoy the show (laughs) and the bed bugs um so we would rehearse and i always noticed no matter what time the rehearsal was he always smelled of whiskey, like, cause full mm. for love. We were like getting close to each other. I said, I didn't want to practice the kiss. So I was like, let's just do it in class. And he was like, sure. But I could still smell him. And then we did the scene in class. And then when I kissed him in class, I definitely smelled his breath, but I was like, whatever. I really didn't care. And then mm. a week later, another uh, classmate of mine, this girl, she was like, how was your experience working with that guy? And I was like, oh, fine, whatever. He's, you know, professional. She said, okay, because I'm rehearsing with him right now and uh, he like reeks of alcohol. And I was like, oh yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess that's like his process. Or, uh, uh, who am I to judge? Anyway, she told the teacher and got him kicked out of class. Oh shit. Oh, and shit. I was very like, oh, wow. Um, I feel like Sam Shepard wouldn't have mind. <laughs> you know, no. There's so many things where even like the acting teacher, um, I feel like he was put in a difficult position. If someone comes forward and says something like that, you have an obligation to keep the class safe and a mm-hmm. professional environment. So he kind of had no choice. But I almost feel like if nothing was said, he would have just he would have been down I, obviously you don't want anyone to die or have like a health risk but i don't <laughs> think it was like that <laughs> i think he was just like sipping on inspiration that's how i saw it you, you didn't feel in danger at any point no. doing sort of scene. a functional alcoholic maybe then, like yeah. like, yeah. Sam yeah. Yeah. like sam shepherd yeah like sam like a little creepy but no sure. more than like other men <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. in school uh <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, regular amount of creepy. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, because I my my experience with like Sam Shepard scenes being performed in college was that there was a lot of thrown chairs. Mm. There was a lot of like yeah. fists through walls yeah, and yeah, shit. Yeah. Like it was it got because the shows are violent and there's yes. moments in Buried Child that you're like. I, I mean, that that feel bordering on the edge of like consent, particularly if you're in college in a school setting yeah. that like I don't know if the actors would feel like or, motivated or, to like speak up to like advocate for or, themselves or even just like moments. like really tricky safety stuff like characters breaking bottles all the time on the right, stage. Right. It's right. Like, well, right. What are, how are we going to deal with that? You yeah, know, yeah. Like yeah. someone yeah. still has to walk way. over that later. Hey, yeah. I yeah. mean, ideally you get the bottles that are made out of sugar, but like yeah. not, maybe but even that stuff is fucking yeah. like it's sharp. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, Sam, I mean, I, I'll be honest, like a guy that I did a Sam Shepard scene with in college, it's only now looking back. I'm like, oh, I had a huge crush on him. Mm. And he was exactly what you were talking about, Urie. He would he would you would taste you would smell the alcohol mm. on him when he came in. He was actually he was unlike your guy, very violent and ended <laughs> up being not very good. But it is sort of like I <laughs> 
also he sucked. Also he sucked. But you were but you were attracted to the danger. But I was. He's I was attracted to the lack of talent too. It's a... Actually, he was very good, and that's that's sort of the uh, the shame of all of it. But like, uh, I auditioned for college too with the Sam Shepard monologue. Oh. I did the late Henry Moss was okay. my uh, was mine. I, d- I paired it with um, the actor's Nightmare by Christopher Durang, R.I.P. Oh. You beautiful, beautiful man. And I was I was the kind of guy who was attracted to Sam Shepard's writing because, and it took me a very long time to realize this. I was attracted to the characters in it because I I wanted to fuck them. Sure, like I, I it was it was it it was sort of like the raw sort of masculine danger of the West. Mm-hmm. Like I was I was physically attracted to that. Just adding so, this to the long list of AJ Diddy <laughs> paraphilia. <laughs> Western men. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which way? Oh my god. Dead playwrights. <laughs> Dead. Dead Western male Fictional playwrights. Alcoholics. Oh, there we go. There we go. Uh, but but that and then it's only sort of over time that I, I I've realized how sad the characters in, Sam, in mm-hmm. Sam Shepard's plays are. I think there is sort of a thing that you go through in college where it's like, oh, this is what masculinity should be, and then you read them now and it's like, oh no. <laughs> These yeah. horrible, sad maniacs. I think this would be honestly a good, as good of time as any to jump right into the play. Yeah, um, let's do it. And we've got a very special treat for you, listeners, because uh, <laughs> we're going to be. I don't know. Why I said that. Hey, like, listeners. Hey, everyone. <laughs> ready for some treats? <laughs> because uh, all of us are actors, and so we're going to be reading some bits from the play as we go through it. Oh my God, how fun! Finally, a part. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for casting me. You're welcome. I want to start with the beginning of the play, the very first words, which in the play are, of course, the stage directions. Now, if you're not familiar with reading plays, there are a lot of things that are communicated in the stage directions that will be interpreted to what you actually see when you are watching the play. Yeah. Who wants to read the stage directions here? I I, I don't really have any preference. Anyone who wants to. I always grew up being the narrator. In the, our, our elementary school oh, you plays. Want to, okay, you want to read, read the it? scripture. And okay. then Welcome to our elementary school production of Buried Child. Yes. <laughs> Yay. Scene, day. Old wooden staircase down left with pale frayed carpet laid down on the steps. The stairs lead off stage left up into the wings with no landing. Up right is an old dark green sofa with the stuffing coming out in spots. Stage right of the sofa is an upright lamp with a faded yellow shade and small night table with several small bottles of pills on it. Down right of the sofa with the screen facing the sofa is a large old-fashioned brown TV. In the dark, the light of the lamp and the TV slowly brighten in the black space. The space behind the sofa upstage is a large screened-in porch with a board floor. Gradually, the form of Dodge is made out. Sitting on the couch, facing the TV. He's covered himself in an old brown blanket. He's very thin and sickly looking in his late 70s. He just stares at the TV. More light fills the stage softly, the sound of light rain. Dodge slowly tilts his head back and stares at the ceiling for a while, listening to the rain. He lowers his head again and stares at the TV. He starts to cough slowly and softly. He holds one hand to his mouth and tries to stifle it. The coughing gets louder and suddenly stops when he hears the sound of his wife's voice coming from the top of the staircase. Dodge? Dodge? You want a pill, Dodge? He doesn't answer. You know what it is, don't you? It's the rain. Weather. That's it. Every time. Every time you get like this, it's the rain. No sooner does the rain start than you start. Dodge? You should see it coming down up here. Just coming down in sheets. Blue sheets. The bridge is pretty near flooded. What's it like down there? Dodge. Catastrophic. What? What'd you say, Dodge? It looks like rain to me. Plain old rain. Rain? Of course it's rain. Are you having a seizure or something? Dodge? I'm coming down. I'm coming down in about five minutes. If you don't answer me. Don't come down. What? Don't come down. <coughs> You should take a pill for that. And it just kind of goes on like this for a while. They're just talking past each other. And you see the disconnect here between Hallie and Dodge. And she's completely off stage. She is upstairs. She's not here. She does not enter 
for about 15 to 20 minutes, depending on your production. There's a pro shot of this. That's the Ed Harris production uh, in the new for the new group. Yeah, um, 2016. It's uh, it is the revised version. Uh, you know, if you get the seven plays, it is the older version. And there's yeah, some apparently this has, has gone under some pretty heavy revisions i would say that it's not like the structure is exactly the same okay it's just that things are elaborated on more shelly is more fleshed out as a character and there are like like little moments that are just given a couple of re- revisions but like for the you most say part it's elaborated exactly the same. on more and i'm like fucking where <laughs> like how, how little was elaborated on in the first version <laughs> right 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 it, it's sort of within lines so it's stuff like People just clarifying what they want and who they are to each other. And, uh, and up top here, we meet Dodge, right. who it play, is played incredibly by Ed Harris in, in, I think, the revival. I think he's sort of the best part of that that whole pro shot. Uh, but he is in a great deal of pain. Uh, yep. He's dying of the death disease. That's right. Uh, <laughs> very slowly. So he's, he's hacking up a lung. Yeah, and... I didn't realize that he was supposed to be dying. I just assumed he was very infirm. Mm, and, and then right. he dies at the end. So, spoilers! 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 Oh, Dodge There's also a child buried outside. I, I, oh my no, God. I even made the note. I was like, it's so refreshing to have like a play or a movie or anything where a character is coughing. And that doesn't mean that they're going to die. Oh, bad news, Brian. Bad news, Brian. Bad news for you. that fucking out. Because it's it's always the thing. It's like no one ever just coughs. No one ever has a coughing fit. Right. But like that happens in real life. All the time. Hallie immediately brings up Christianity pretty quickly into this thing. Uh, She talks about how she doesn't know if the pills are Christian. Right. (laughs) And that no one really has an answer for if they are. And she says this line, which I think is very, very integral to my understanding of the play, which is uh, pain is pain, pure and simple. Suffering is a different matter. Mm. And that I think is what's happening to every one of the characters in this play. They are choosing to suffer yeah. rather than address the pain head on by taking a pill. That's very Protestant of them, um, which, which which they are, which they are. Also, also very, I mean, honestly, no, I think this I think this is a little pan Christian here. Mm. This is a very Catholic kind of ideas. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you have to think it's like flagellation. And yeah, everything true, and true. Right, but she hates the Catholics, man. <laughs> she certainly does. Yeah, yes. I was confused by by this guy who's not a priest but he's called father and he wears essentially catholic vestments uh, maybe he's in this production we'll, we'll, we'll get to him Those later Illinois Episcopalians. <laughs> but for the time being i want to really focus on the relationship between dodge and hallie at some point these two presumably loved each other they it, certainly did get married they got married at the very least and they had a few kids yep uh, things were good for a while, apparently. Uh, but now there doesn't really seem to be anything at all there anymore. Yeah, I feel like right away it establishes these characters that aren't in touch with reality mm-hmm. by choice. Mm-hmm. The way Hallie is in the other room for so many minutes, mm-hmm. carrying out you know entire conversations. But like, what is it really about? Nothing is being said. She's just kind of yapping. Right. And not really paying attention to what's actually happening to Dodge in the other room. They have a lot in common. They're both burying reality, right? Like not dealing with it. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. <laughs> 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 Wait a second. Give me a second. I'm having a moment. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Yure is sitting on a desk, crossing her legs in front of all of us. I'm basically professor. Wow. Yeah, fuck yeah. this. <laughs> I'm going to go write my dissertation now. Yeah. I don't think anyone else has thought of this. Wow. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, but yeah, in their own different ways, right? Like they're both ignoring reality. Mm. Uh, later on, I think he says something like, I don't want to talk anymore. Mm. He's just kind of like, I don't want to talk. I don't see the point in talking. Um, that's his way of dealing with this situation. And I feel like she has the opposite reaction where she's yeah. just talking about literally anything right. forever. So Hallie goes on about like sort of her like, past like romances for a bit here we get a bit of backstory that she spent a lovely weekend with a a horse breeder down in florida even though or is it california and we start sort of getting this plays 
main idea is about exposition, which is like, oh, you want answers? Fuck you. Yeah, uh, yeah, which is no, cool. Because this isn't an exposition. This is just a lady talking about some stuff right. that she was up to. Uh, it, I mean, it does lay the groundwork sort of for their marriage. But if we're talking about like the relationship between the two of them, it is sort of this thing that she is trying to needle him. We into don't know something. even that they're married yet. That's true. That doesn't come up until Dodge is talking to someone else, I think, oh, and says, so you know, I, just, I, I wait I, for my wife to come down here. I guess no, I just yeah. automatically assumed they were married. You do, I mean, you do yeah. generally, but it's like it's also so, so on edge. Like he's Sam Shepard is working in this register that is doing absurdism kind of at the end goal, but it's through realism. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, all the dialogue is like classic realist kind of stuff. Which is sort of what you were mentioning earlier, Yuri, about like how yeah. it sort of finds itself in this really strange space where you don't know to what extent you can trust what you're hearing, right? Mm-hmm. I feel like they're not like linear progression. Yeah, of right. what's, It's just like these little representations of these people in a realistic setting. Well, in one example of somebody who we only sort of see a portion of, I think, is is Tilden, who's the next character who shows up here. As Dodge and Hallie are kind of going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, Dodge yells for a guy named Tilden who just comes on stage and yeah. he's carrying a fuckload of corn well, in his and, arms. And there's been this whole thing about like, oh, Tilden's just in the kitchen. You right. haven't heard him shout back at all. Right. But he's supposed to be in the kitchen, which is just right there. Right. Right, right, right. It immediately it was the first time that like it clicked in my head that maybe this wasn't like a real space in in yeah. that we mm-hmm. would think about it, that you know, the realism sort of shattered because again, Tilden enters and he's carrying a shit ton of corn and it's revealed pretty quickly there is no corn in the backyard. Right. There's no yeah. corn. There hasn't been a crop there since nineteen thirty four. So the implication starts to become maybe that he went and stole corn from the neighbors. Yeah. Maybe. 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 I was just like, okay, what does this mean? Yeah. <laughs> I also right. thought, is he a ghost? Is this some kind of yeah. flashback? Well, he's holding corn. He's so. holding he's corn. Holding ghosts can't hold corn. <laughs> yeah. What well, if it's ghost that's corn? That's ghost logic. <laughs> ghost yeah, no, corn. it's dead corn. It's dead corn. All of that. Yeah. <laughs> Very that. Um, <laughs> well, okay. So one of the ideas I brought up to Josh was that like, um, this unfulfilled potential mm-hmm. uh, in the mm. play with all the characters. So the corn, yeah, like it's supposed to be growing, but no, it's supposed to not be growing, but it used to grow. Right. Now it's maybe growing again, but I guess it had to grow for why is this happening today? What is the question? Like, why yeah. is this day different from other why days? Why this play now? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Why is this day different from all other days? Like, I guess the truth is about to come out. So mm-hmm. corn, yeah, it doesn't make any sense, but it's coming out. Um, I don't know why he threw it on to Dodge. Like he husked it or big. I, I have to. I have some it's theories. A, about it's a that. very yeah. yeah. It's it's part of more like surreal behavior yeah. as opposed to like because obviously he's got something wrong with him upstairs. Yes. Yeah. And and you have people who are engaging in in odd behaviors. Yeah. You know, not taking the pills that they should be taking or whatever. But like all that, all that kind of stuff has a reason to it. You mm-hmm. understand why people do self destructive things or whatever. But like. Tilden starts just throwing the husks of the corn just on the floor right, and right. then puts them on his dad later when he's asleep. Yeah. Well, and, and I actually have a little excerpt here which connects to all of this stuff. Have you been taking those pills? Those pills always make you talk crazy. Tilden, has he been taking those pills? Those teeny little blue pills? He hasn't took anything. What have you been taking? It's not raining in California or Florida or at the racetrack. Only in Illinois. This is the only place it's raining. All over the rest of the world, it's bright golden sunshine. Which ones did you take? Tilden, you must have seen him take something. He never took a thing. Then why is he talking crazy? Crazy, 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 crazy. I've been here the whole time. Then you've both been taking something. I've just been husking the corn. Where'd you get that corn anyway? Why is the house suddenly full of corn? Bumper crop. (laughs) Unexplainable. We haven't had corn here for over 30 years. Old back lot's full of corn, far as the eye can see. Like an ocean. Things keep happening when you're upstairs, you know. The world doesn't stop just because you're upstairs. Corn keeps growing. Rain keeps raining. I'm not unaware of the world around me. Thank you very much. It so happens that I have an overall view from the upstairs. A panorama. The backyard's in plain view of my window. And there's no corn to speak of. Absolutely none. Tilden wouldn't lie. If he says there's corn, there's corn. What's the meaning of this corn, Tilden? It's a mystery to me. 
I was out and back there and the rain was coming down and I didn't feel like coming back inside. I didn't feel like the cold so much. I didn't mind the wet, so I just was walking. I was muddy, but I didn't mind the mud so much. And I looked up and I saw this stand of corn. But in fact, I was standing in it, surrounded. It was over my head. There isn't any corn outside, Tilden. There's no corn. It's not the season for corn. Now, you must have either stolen this corn or you bought it. He doesn't have a red cent to his name. He's totally dependent. So you stole it. I didn't steal it. I don't want to get kicked out of Illinois. I was kicked out of New Mexico, and I don't want to get kicked out of Illinois. You're going to get kicked out of this house, Tilden, if you don't tell me where you got that corn. Tilden starts crying, (laughs) (laughs) but he keeps husking the corn. Why'd you have to tell him that? Who cares where he got the corn? Why'd you have to go and threaten him with expulsion? It's your fault, you know. You're the one that's behind all of this. I suppose you thought it'd be funny. Some joke. Cover the house with corn husks. You better get this cleaned up before Bradley sees it. Bradley's not getting in the front door. Bradley's going to be very upset when he sees this. He doesn't like to see the house in disarray. He can't stand it when one thing is out of place. The slightest thing. You know how he gets. Bradley doesn't even live here. It's his home as much as ours. He was born in this house. He was born in a hog wallow. <laughs> Don't you say that. Don't you ever say that. He was born in a goddamn hog wallow. That's where he was born, and that's where he belongs. He doesn't belong in this house. I don't know what's come over you, Dodge. I don't know what in the world's come over you. You've become an evil, spiteful, vengeful man. You used to be a good man. Six of one, a half dozen the other. You sit here day and night, festering away, decomposing. Smelling up the house with your putrid body, hacking your head off till all hours of the morning, thinking up mean, evil, stupid things to say about your own flesh and blood. He's not my flesh and blood. My flesh and blood's out there in the backyard. <gasps> the secret. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, no. The secret. Is this, is this the, the titular buried child? So I think we need to take a moment here to just establish... What buried child is riffing on? Mm-hmm. Because <laughs> most plays up until this point, most living room dramas, as we call them in the American theater, had been built around a big secret that is slowly revealed mm-hmm. over the course of the night and then explosively comes out at the very end. Right. right. Because who is the father of realism? Edward Eugene O'Neill. O'Neill. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur Miller. No, not American. Didn't start William here. William Shakespeare. Oh, Chekhov? Absolutely not. No, 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 <laughs> no. Wow. F, F, F. Oh, my F, God. I F. failed. Oh, Brian shoved Uriah off <laughs> oh my God. the desk. He is sitting cross-legged now. <laughs> In the far-flung oh regions of the world, uh-huh. far up north. Yeah. In a foreign <laughs> land <laughs> called Norway. Mm. Oh, God. Oh, Ibsen. Oh, fucking Henry. Oh fucking God. Ibsen. It's because right, it's right, ghosts. Right. Right. It's his play Ghosts, which shook the world when it, oh my oh, well, it was not very successful. And it I was not played very Nora. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> stupid. <laughs> and Ghosts is all about not literal ghosts. There's not a single literal ghost in that play. It but it's all syphilis. about how uh, family members are doing each other mm. and, got and syphilis, getting syphilis, venereal syphilis. disease. Okay. Yeah. Can't get yeah. rid of this. And that's syphilis. the big secret. <laughs> that is the big secret. Right. And then it's like, yes, you're syphilitic. Whoops. Wow. Yeah. Uh, wow. And, wow. and from there we get to yeah Eugene O'Neill. There's always like a, a forgotten brother or uh, someone's doing their cousin or something. Like everyone's kind of walking up to the line of like how much more incest can we get to with this one? Right, right. right. Until now, wow. it's just like you and know, one, you know, penicillin has been invented, so syphilis. You just go to the doctor. You just go to the doctor, get a little shot now. And, you know, the thing is that, like, you know, incest sort of reached its uh, climax in the great play uh, (laughs) In a Forest Dark and Deep by one Neil LeBute, uh, where it's just a brother and sister kissing on stage. No, Uh, I don't. It's a bad play. Why did you even mention him? I I hate you. I was in London. I saw the production. Matthew Fox was in it. And who did Matthew Fox play? I don't care. Jack Shepard in Lost. So uh, You don't like Neil Abute? I, that is putting it so mildly. (laughs) Yeah, we don't. We don't talk about it. I have gotten, 
He's he, the child we buried. Him. <laughs> no, there, there was a point where he like would stalk my Twitter feed under his various little like sock puppet accounts that he kept for those awful, wretched, shitty little TV shows that oh my he would God, run. He's, obsessed. he's a yeah. wretched, horrible little cunt. Is he, is he a, like a name search guy? Like he'll he is, search his own yes, name. Yes, he's one hundred percent a name search guy. Uh, he's uh, he's also showrunner. He's for a while, also yeah. allegedly an impregnate your students guy. Oh. Allegedly. Oh, wow. Allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no. It, it's like he that. hates women, but not even in like an interesting way. I I have dis- right. I've had so I've never responded well to anything of his that I've seen mm-hmm. because in addition to everything else, he just is bad. Yeah. I, I <laughs> he saw, just it, sucks. The art and the artist suck. He yeah. has no <laughs> reasons to be anything uh, yeah i saw i saw reasons to be pretty on broadway and Boy. i was there the night that a guy stood up during the first argument scene and yelled cunt at the stage wow. and then left he was yelling at neil and it was me legend yeah. <laughs> but anyway uh uh sam shepherd oh uh, yes so sam shepherd started writing plays because he was a huge fan of eugene o'neill and yeah. you know i think that comes through in a lot of his stage directions and a lot of his his stories or whatever um, eugene o'neill another another guy who was he was just like a fisherman Nor- and a normal guy too. Really yeah, normal, normal with no guy issues. with lots of alcohol problems. Yeah, yeah. Who, who could have been the 1910s version of a rock star? Looked like Jack Nicholson, shockingly, like <laughs> shockingly I, like you're Jack Nicholson. Just talking about Jack Nicholson because you saw him in that. Movie. I did see him in red. That was just Jack Nicholson. No, no, that was Eugene O'Neill. <laughs> <laughs> that was Eugene O'Neill. Uh, but he's uh, real, damn it! He's real. <laughs> he's real to me. <laughs> is Jack Nicholson in the room right now, Brian? Uh, no, he's at Poopies. <laughs> oh, he's at Poopies. So one of the other big plays that inspired like the living room drama were, were of course, the plays of Arthur Miller, All My right. Sons being one yep. of them, even though it doesn't take place in the living room, it's outside for most of it. It's in the backyard, yeah. It's in the backyard, <laughs> but again, a secret is there. It is eventually revealed. Uh, protagonist is done. And then, of yep. course, there is Edward Albies, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. Uh, Which starts to incorporate something of, like, Beckett absurdism a little it's bit not, a it's, it's a not it's not a play where anything is necessarily not real mm-hmm. right? right it's just that you have a couple that has the only thing that they really have together is this shared fiction that they've built up their house is just a house but you can tell how they're trapped in their own sort of neuroses and waspishnesses. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, Yuri, uh, what is your sort of frame of reference for the living room drama outside of the context of Buried Child? Like, was that something that you ever got into or watched or performed in or anything like that? Uh, I don't know. Sitcoms. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. I feel yeah. like living room is such a, like an American setting. Right. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And... I actually never really thought of it that way, like in that framework, because I think I've gotten so used to like digesting that. But um, oh, sure. yeah, I need to think about that. I don't think I have anything interesting to say. Okay. Ugh, that was interesting. It's going to come, that was, to, me. That was, that was <laughs> come to me later. I'm yeah, like, yeah, oh. yeah. yeah. When, when well, you remember, just jump right in. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. And so what, what he's doing here is that he's kind of taking a lot of his sort of experimental stuff and injecting it into the living room drama. But, in addition to that, he's also taking away the main driving motor of it, which is like, oh, you want to know the secret? Here's the secret. It's the title of the play. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. He is disintegrating the American play, and he's just like, however, sift through however the he's yeah. also throwing some like red herrings at you mm-hmm. because right. you learn that Dodge and uh, Haley have a dead son. Right. Yes, they have a son who, who who died in the war or not. Well, no. he was in the war well, he died because and then of the he Catholics. died in a motel. Yeah, yeah because of yeah. the Catholics. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that, that was that, that's the mom's reasoning. But right. it is implied that he killed himself in a hotel. Right. Room. Yeah. Right. Okay. And so and, and Ansel yeah. was supposed to be the golden boy. The, the way the way that I like looking at Barry Child is kind of like what would happen if you trapped the cast of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf into a house and made them play the play um, uh, like a thousand times. Mm. But then the audience left at a certain point and then the director never came back, but they still just had to perform the show. And how would that change and alter the plot over time? Sure. Like if you just trapped these characters, like this is the last time they're ever performing this show. 
everyone is dying and bored, so they're just bringing on corn from off stage. Well, it's yeah. like justify this uh, motherfucker. And the play feels very, very cursed, doesn't it? Like yeah. they're, they're just like sitting in this world. Yeah, it's so I, dark. I, I didn't feel the production with all of the like TV and movie actors in it that we watched. I didn't think that felt very cursed at all, and that that's what no. I really missed. Mm. Sure, it felt polished. It felt bright. It okay. felt clean. I mean, and I think that kind of speaks to the new group specifically, that company Uh, and the work that they do. But I'm more interested in like the world of the play itself and like going back to that shit with the corn. Right. You want to see the dust in the air. And I feel like that's that's almost a constant with. With Sam Shepard's plays. You're always in yeah. like in a motel room. Yes. Or, yeah. Oh my God. So <laughs> my dad, he was telling me about because he did some theater in college. He didn't okay. major in it, but he did some theater. Okay. And he was like involved in a production of Curse of the Starving Class. Okay. And oh, yeah. uh, let's pee on stage. Yes. For real. So, <laughs> yes. So somebody peed on stage for real. And also they got a real goat. Oh, like hell a, yeah. So there's like a goat in it. Yeah. And he and this was like before Craigslist and stuff. So like, <laughs> I was like how you did had to you go to the phone book for yeah, a goat guy. Yeah. <laughs> Page down to G. <laughs> no, but the story is like, OK, so remember the ex-girlfriend who helped me with the monologue? Yeah, the dramaturg. Yeah. yeah, the dramaturg. Your so new she, mom. Yeah. My yeah. new mom. Yeah. So <laughs> she was directing the play. OK. And my dad was like smitten so he was like gonna do everything that she needed of course you know so she was like i need a goat and he was like yes ma'am I, i'm your goat guy yeah, now. so he went to get a goat and uh <laughs> the goat like went to the bathroom and the back the goat got <laughs> sick yeah. no the goat got sick and he was like returning the goat and like driving he had to drive like two hours to return this goat <laughs> no and i was like I can't even get a text back. <laughs> and here you are doing the most, okay? The goat shot in your back seat. You had to clean that up. You had to return the goat, drive two hours back, like I think oh I think that's a great God. that's a great dating app profile. Would you go get Would a goat for me? Would you go get a goat yeah, for yeah, my yeah. production? Yeah. yeah. But then if you're familiar with the works of Edward Albee, that could go very bad. That could go oh, very differently. Yeah. Oh. Who is Sylvia? Who is she? Who is she? Who are these Sylvias coming, coming down? down. We'll, we'll talk about her at some oh point too. But uh Hell yeah. And I feel like like Albee also like for having established that play, the Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf mm-hmm. of it yeah. all, right? A very li- like the living room drama to end all living room dramas right also wrote a play called tiny alice which i think is closer to what buried child is going for okay it is this very abstract deconstruction of a family drama secret play with incest and priests and dealing with sort of religion in this very yeah, confronting way honestly the thing the one thing that i could compare this play to the most is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre one and two. Oh yeah, <laughs> like this okay. is Leatherface's family just yeah. hanging out. That's who before Bradley the tourist, is, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's so scary. It's really fucking freaky, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and Bradley actually chainsawed his own leg off. We mentioned Bradley a little bit yeah. earlier in that scene, but Bradley is the psychopath brother who we will meet a little yes. bit later. But he, it is revealed before he comes on that he he lost his leg not in Vietnam like you'd kind of imagine it would be for a mm-hmm. '70s play, but just. Because because he just fucked up a chainsaw and like sawed his leg yeah. off. And in this filmed production, Bradley is played by television's Rich Summer, He's who is great. in uh, Who's Mad Men. Incredible. So you also might remember from Firewatch. Yeah, hell He's yeah. The dude. guy well, in it, Firewatch. And yeah. what's interesting too is like, yeah, Rich Summer, you think of him as being kind of a nebbish guy, but yeah. not in this. Because Bradley, we should talk about him real quick because yeah, let's talk about the Brad. first act ends with Bradley making his entrance. Basically, yeah. There's a big back and forth between Tilden and Dodge. Uh, you know, Dodge is like, don't take my cap off. Don't take my cap off. Or Bradley's going to come in and shave my head. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this, I guess, has been a topic of contention uh, because Bradley just keeps shaving his dad's head for some oh reason. Oh my God, why does he do that? Because he's fucking weird. This, one, so this weird. one felt to me like it didn't make sense at first and it makes sense as the story goes along mm. where unlike the corn thing where it's like I've just put all the corn husks on my dad and he's right. asleep. From from Tilden, who's this son who, he's not a malicious person at all. You know, whatever he's got going on, he's, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say he's nice or anything. He's just there. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but But Bradley here is a really sadistic man. Yeah. And so when the story is told up front, oh yeah, he cuts my hair and and he cuts it too close. 
Well, yeah, you're here. Here you have this old man who's like an invalid. He can't make his way to the barbershop. So his family's going to be cutting his hair and is not good at it. Yeah. But it becomes pretty clear later on. Bradley is just a sadist. Yes. Right. Right. But he also is a very fastidious sadist. Mm. And so he likes his house in order. Right. Mm-hmm. He doesn't like yeah, things he has being his all over sense the place. of where things need to be. Again, right. Leatherface's family right. in the Texas Chainsaw Mess. Uh, right. Right. Yeah. But like if his dad's hair it. gets too messy, he yeah. doesn't like that. Right. right. So he has, feels the need to clean it up. And I think it's also a really cool metaphor about how. He, you know, because the whole time you're saying he has to keep the cap on, he has to protect himself like he mm. has to be aware or Bradley's going to sneak up on him much in the same way that fascism in America will always sneak up unless you're vigilant to fight against it. Sure. Right. That it is sort of the default Moda, modus operandi for America unless you are actively trying to prevent it from happening by keeping mm. your cap on. I think that's yeah. true. I, yeah. I, it, that, yeah. There's like this, this strong, aggressive, physical violence that is embodied in the character of Bradley and it's the same violence that one could that that is at the core I think of what America is Um, and I think with Bradley too he you know he's not a Judge Holden character who's able who is not only willing but able to commit every act of violence that he can he's a failure who has one leg yeah and who is uh, very easily um, disabled by his 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 less capable of violence family members right, right right they're able to just take his leg away if they feel like it which is such an exceptionally cruel act mm-hmm. to yeah. commit against someone right and so he's always kind of acting out against his own weakness but also acting out of his own malice and then his weakness stops him from being able to take it further oh yeah, yeah. it's so tox- toxic masculine yeah because he's like castrated right if mm-hmm. the leg is gone kind of yeah. sure yeah and it's like he didn't even lose it in the war yeah, he just <laughs> chopped it off himself yeah. with a chainsaw yeah so there's lots of self-hate and yeah. and, 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 the, and the way it's depicted in, the, in that production which is done quite well is that he starts screaming like right. high pitched, like right. he's a, like literally like being castrated like he's a small child yeah, again. yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I do want to put my my theory forth about the bearing in Cornstalk since we brought it up oh, twice yes, now. Please. Sure. Um, I think that for Tilden, who is presented as more simple minded, right, or at least yeah. very sort of one track minded, a little very anxious, a little like of mice and men, yes. uh, a little bit, a little bit, particularly in this production. I don't know if that's the only way you can play the character. No. I think it, it was interesting. He, he comes off a little bit Tim Robinson in this production. <laughs> yeah, Paul Sparks just kind of looks like Tim Robinson. Yeah, that's, true. Yeah, I, I, I think that, that, that's yeah. sort of an unfortunate thing about it. I think he's doing a fine job, but you yeah. know, it is it is certainly one take on it. Um, but I think that Tilden knows. That spoilers for the plot of this play, his child is buried out back. Right. And that by burying his dad in that corn, he is okay. like recreating the circumstances that his child is going through. Mm. Right. It is just another thing mm-hmm. of like, I'm trying to connect with this kid. But in another way, the reason why the land gives Tilden the corn in the first place and the later on all the other vegetables and everything. We are in this is assuming, of course, that that is the truth and that he didn't find it somewhere and else, which, is, un- somewhere which else. is totally unclear. Right. But mm-hmm. I think that the land is if we take Tilden's word as gospel that he right. went out back and the land just gave it to him. It is because he is the one who is trying to uncover the pain at the heart of this family and confront it. And by doing so, America itself the land Mm -hmm. is like, yeah, you need to confront this so things can grow again so that we can Mm. become good. Mm. Uh, You have to confront the sin at the heart of it. So that's what I think is going on with the corn. Yeah. Mm. I think the one place where I would disagree with that analysis is the idea that America, the, so that America can become good. I I just don't think Sam Shepard believes in that. I think he's just looking at the ugliness and saying, man, I'm going to go drink now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess there's a little bit that contradicts that, I think, at the very, very end with the final monologue. Well, we'll but get, yeah, we'll yeah, get yeah, there. Yeah, we will, we will, I'm yeah. curious, Yuri, did you have any thoughts about this? Well, how long was Tilden home at this point? Because he came back, right? He right. was gone for a long time. He was gone for years, yeah. yeah. He hasn't been back for very long. Right. It's not like he's been back for a couple of years. No. It's giving like a few days or yeah, a few yeah, yeah. weeks Yeah, even. so he yeah. couldn't have like planted the corn or anything. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, it makes sense with the whole American dream thing because corn is so American. Right. right. So yeah, right, right, if right, he's, yeah. okay, wow, that was right in front of me. I like never thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> you explained well, it. Oh, like, no, no. I mean, wow. it's one of those things that like, it, you know, you can kind of dramaturg anything, but like in this play, it is like you kind of have 
have to if you want to make your way through it because it is uh, on its on its surface pretty pretty simple in right. terms of like what just happens beat for beat. Well, yeah, because I mean, what happens beat for beat at the end of this act is that we we get Bradley, the previously mm-hmm. mentioned you know big scary sadist um judd fry type <laughs> and uh he pulls out a pair of uh electric he, it's not a pair it's, it's a single <laughs> dual wheel <laughs> pulls out. yeah like a like an electric electric uh, clipper, razor yeah. clipper uh and he starts shaving his dad's head and the and sound cuts him and everything yeah and, yeah. and the it's sound violent. of rain starts to rise the lights start to dim and that's the end of act one And so when we get back, we're going to get to the rest of this play. We're going to unpack some more shit to do with corn and carrots. We're going to figure out who who are these buried children coming down. So stay tuned right after this. This season, the Autograph Theatre Company is proud to present one of the most incendiary playwrights of the 60s and 70s. And at no point thereafter, Pearl Fartber. Oh, sure, we're all American as apple pie. Except this pie ain't got no apples, ma. This pie's filled with nothing but death and lies and napalm! Witness theater classics born anew and feel their pulsating, throbbing timeliness shoot you directly in the face. Plays like My Mother Was Like the Vietnam War, but worse. Ah, I'll tell you, Mikey. This Vietnam War? Think it might be a big old crock of shit! Mikey? I'm a ghost, Jim. I've been a ghost this whole time. Also, I'm your dad. No! Stare directly into the asshole of God as you confront the existential dread and unknowable horrors of Fartbur's deep dive into the madness of humanity. There's a bear in the woods and his name is Death. Sometimes, when I'm out on the lake with Pa, I get this feeling deep in my roiling stomach that something's watching us from the trees, licking its lips. Light in its time, waiting for me in the dark. Feels like, feels like there's a bear in the woods and his name is. Da- oh, 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 fuck! Uh, oh, oh my God! No, no, why? why? Directed by the why? visionary why? Belgian director <laughs> Walouy <Wallowie laughs> van Hova, this thrilling oh, no. revival no. takes the metaphorical bear and heroically transforms it into a literal oh, live no. bear. My, my innards! Now I have a wolf and a bear. Also, the bear was a ghost. Same. And coming this fall to the Henry Kissinger Theater, we round out our soon-to-be award-winning season with a revival of Pearl Fartburst's controversial Pulitzer Prize-winning masterwork, Clouds in Their Time, starring Mark Ruffalo, John C. Riley, and Ray Romano as the infamous Cloud Brothers. Where were you? Oh, you all left and I was stuck with him this whole time. The good whoa, son, whoa, whoa, the loyal whoa. son. Take your second my reward, breathe. huh? Nobody's When's saying it gonna you don't be deserve Clint's a reward, to shine. Deborah. When's this gonna be Clint's lamp too. or Clint's Deborah. TV or goodbye. Clint's house? Deborah. I'm so sick of you living in both of your You're shadows. Like I'm drowning in them. Mr. Drowning right now. Deborah. I'm drowning Should in both of your shadows, and I can't name, even. Mr. Cellophane, because you can look right through me. Oh no, we're all ghosts. Deborah! The New York Times heralds clouds in their time, the most incest I've ever seen on stage. The Wall Street Journal raves. Pearl Fartber really doubled down on the whole ghost thing, huh? And theater friend at Blogspot declares, I saw this with my mom. So subscribe today and get access to our exclusive talkbacks featuring Pearl Fartber herself. I fist fought David Mamet once, and he's a punk ass bitch. The Autograph Theater. If nobody watches a play, does it make a sound? So last time I was on this show for the 24 episode, I was in Tokyo. And the reason I was there, now I can say it because it's been like almost two years, but I was there (laughs) because I was on hold to be on the bachelor oh, in japan yeah. Hell yeah i didn't get it as Damn. you notice there's no giant ring on my finger <laughs> you do actually <laughs> have a giant ring on your finger <laughs> the implication that you would have gone on the bachelor and won is i like is, that is too lovely. Yeah. <laughs> but you would have let's be real yeah. of course you would have you're I, in it to win it it's yeah. it's tricky but um you would I'm have lived sure. in a baby pink house baby pink house um <laughs> yeah japanese men i don't know if uh, it's jury's out if they like me or not because mm. I, I like 
talk about a lot of things, but um, <laughs> Japanese men sound out in the comments. Right. Yes, let us know. Um, so yeah, I was thinking about all these reality TV shows around dating and romance. Um, there's this new one in Japan. They came out with one season and they're currently filming the second one. I know because someone I know is in it. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. It's called Love Village. Okay. And it's about people who have either missed out on their chance for love and they're later in their years, mm. they're old. Okay, and this is oh. their last chance at love. <laughs> they will so never they have the, another chance. So they're 32, like, 33 years old. Okay, no, but literally, <laughs> you have it's 35 and up. Oh, no. Oh, no. When you said old, I was like, oh, that sounds really sweet. It's like elderly people <laughs> out in <laughs> like, rural Japan or it's something. It's just people no. in their 30s. Oh, like, the, like, everyone, but that's the thing. Everyone thought The Golden Bachelor was going to be like this like really heartfelt show, and then it turned out that boomers didn't know how to like play the game and so just fell in love for real and it's just fucking devastating. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, Everyone great. thought this? We're yeah, not here no. to talk about this, AJ. We're here to listen to Yuri talk about Love Village. That's true. Yeah. Tell I us mean, more about Love Village. It, it did did they on... put them in a village? Okay. So this is <laughs> yeah. why it's insulting even more. Okay. Because usually these, you know, reality dating shows, they're in some kind of tropical location, like yeah. beautiful, close to the beach, whatever. Right. They put these Sorry, elderly 35 year olds. <laughs> Geriatric. <laughs> yes. In uh it's called a kominka. It's basically like a old, like Japanese style, like wooden home that's okay. like, oh, there's electricity. Bonus. You know, sure. It's yeah. like, okay, sure. You know, I'm sure sliding the sliding doors. Yes, old house. It's, it's like the, the Japanese equivalent of a cabin in the woods in Vermont. Something basically. like that. Yeah. 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 And sure. that's been there for hundreds of years. And this is where they're filming the show, and it's very like co-op vibe. Like mm -hmm. they like cook together okay. and you know raise their own crops I don't know. <laughs> a lot of corn, 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 a lot of yeah. corn. Yeah. obviously it's not just people in their 30s there are people in their 50s as well because it's 35 and up mm, sure and that. listening to them like say things like usually in these reality shows you hear people say like oh my god like in japanese like, doki doki which means like oh like my heart is mm -hmm. like racing like i have butterflies basically okay but mm. you hear like oh my god my blood pressure is rising <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, okay. I gotta take a pill for this. <laughs> yeah, and someone was like, "You should apply next year." I'm like, "You know what? <laughs> I, uh, I'm unfollowing you." Uh, so. uh. <laughs> but no, yeah, my friend. He went to film the second season and he actually told me it was because of me because I talked about Love Village. I do my stand up sets in English and Japanese. OK. And then this is one of the Japanese Incredible. nights in Tokyo. And I was like talking about Love Village because my friend sent it to me as like, you should watch this because uh, it was during Halloween. She was like, you want to watch something really scary? I was like, yeah, <laughs> Love Village. I'm, I'm horrified. So that was really funny. And that was my part of my bit or whatever. Sure. And the guy watching, he was like, oh, he's like, you know older than 35 right, and right. he was just <laughs> applied got in and oh shit so did you, it. you're the reason why i'm he, the reason you're the, the meaning in his life you're the inspiration oh, i am the wow. village yes <laughs> <laughs> well we're gonna i guess what take... takes a village to raise a child yeah it does, yes, does. It does. It, it, but what it, if the, what it if takes that's... one family to bury one there we go yeah. there we go nailed it nailed takes it a lot one. to make a stew yeah uh, pinch of love and laughter too so we are back <laughs> <laughs> with Act Two of Buried Child. Hell yeah. Uh, and as we were saying, the end of Act One, very dark, uh, extremely dark. Uh, you can hardly even see what's going on. It's so dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like Thief or Thief 2 mm -hmm. in that regard. Mm -hmm. uh, but, it's uh, like, what? I don't know those plays. Don't are those worry Sam about Shepard it. plays? Yes. Yeah, yeah, those yeah, are yeah, those yeah. awesome. Uh, I mean, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no one's read them I all. haven't read all 65. I no. could see a Sam Shepard. Uh, character being like a thief npc absolutely like oh sure thinking that they heard something waiting five seconds <laughs> what was that noise <laughs> uh, i guess it was nothing uh, <laughs> uh, God. we do get two brand new characters here at the beginning of act two and this is contrasting so strongly with the end of act one because yeah. all of a sudden the, you know we're in the same set it's later than was the case in Act One, although how much later, it's honestly not yeah. entirely clear. Like Dodge took his medication, and one of the reasons why he doesn't take it is because it just knocks him out. Right. So he's just been unconscious, which is how his head got shaved. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And now he's just on the couch with a blanket over him. Yeah. Uh, Bradley has seemingly left and has, in fact, 
left. I don't know where he goes in this act, but out. he's he's out. <laughs> he's out. He's just out and about. Uh, For the plot needed him to leave, and that, so he did. That is true. Tilden is also nowhere in sight at the top of this act. Uh, but who do we see? Our two young lovers enter, Vince and Shelly. Yes. Yeah. And do you like jazz? <laughs> <laughs> well, you better. <laughs> two dangerous hippies. Hey, so they're real. Up. They're real hep cats. These two. <laughs> yeah, hey, the, the, the new the new version that we watched seems to try and like straddle the line between like, oh, this doesn't take place in the seventies. Don't worry about it. And also, it so takes place it in the seventies. You can't get around the language. You really well, can't. And just like the basic premise of like an American farming family. And the farm has fallen apart. There's no way a family can maintain it. That is entirely built on this period of time that Sam Shepard grew up in. Yeah. Where like we went from like 50% rural population to like 20 percent mm -hmm. yeah yeah and they talk they talk about how the last bumper crop was in 1934 yeah right so mm -hmm. it is still very much set in the 70s but like costume design wise they tr do try and make this very modern and also the performances by these two actors i think are incredibly modern yeah, yeah they're, performances they're, it feels kind of like a different world but you know what we're gonna do mm. we're gonna put our own spin on it here. oh oh yeah so in what we have here uh vince and shelly have entered the house Shelly has discovered that Dodge is right there on the couch mm -hmm. <laughs> and Dodge has just woken up. Did you bring the whiskey? Grandpa, it's me, Vince. I'm Vince, Tilden's son. You remember? You didn't do what you told me. You didn't stay here with me. Grandpa, I haven't been here until just now. I just got here. You left. Abandoned me. You went outside like we told you not to do. You went out there and back in the rain. Is he okay? I don't know. Uh, uh, look, Grandpa, don't you remember me? Vince, your grandson. I know it's been a while and my, my hair's longer, maybe. See what happens when you leave me alone? You see that? That's what happens. And at this point, Vince looks at Dodge's head and you can see there's like scabs on it. It's like open and bleeding because of how rough the haircut was. What's going on, Grandpa? Where's Hallie? Don't worry about her. She won't be back for days. She's absconded. She says she'll be back, but she won't be. <laughs> there's life in the old girl yet. How did you do that to your head? I didn't do it. Don't be ridiculous. What do you think I am, an animal? Well, who did then? Who do you think did it? Who do you think? Uh, Vince, maybe we ought to go. I don't like this. I mean, this isn't my idea of a good time. Just a second. Grandpa, look, I just got here. I just now got here. I haven't been here for six years. I don't know anything that's happened. You don't know anything? No. Well, that's good. That's good. It's much better to not know anything. Much, much better. Isn't there anybody here with you? Tilden's here. No, Grandpa. Tilden's in New Mexico. That's where I was going. I'm going out there to see him. We just stopped off here because it was on the way. Well, you're going to be disappointed. Uh, Vince, why don't we spend a night in a motel and come back in the morning? We could have breakfast, a shower. Maybe everything will be different. Don't be scared. There's nothing to be scared of. He's just old. I'm not scared. You two are not my idea of the perfect couple. Oh, really? Why is that? Shh, don't aggravate him. There's something wrong between the two of you. Something not compatible like chalk and cheese. Grandpa, where did Hallie go? Maybe we should call her. I don't understand why you're here by all by yourself. Isn't anybody looking after you? What are you talking about? Do you know what you're talking about? Are you just talking for the sake of talking, lubricating the gums? I'm just trying to Hallie figure- Hallie is out with her boyfriend, the right Reverend Dewis. He's not a breeder man, but a man of God. Next best thing, I suppose. I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. Good luck. I, I expected everything to be different. I'm, I mean, the same, like, like it used to be. Who are you to expect anything? Who are you supposed to be? I'm Vince, your grandson. You've got to remember me. Vince, my grandson, that's rich. Tilden's son. Tilden's son, Vince. He had two, I guess. Two? No, look, you haven't seen me in a long time. When was the last time? There is something to this scene of, like, uh, if played in a very particular way, it can be like, 
well, everything hasn't been the same since mm -hmm. the incident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, like, it keeps pointing at the secret. You kind of need an actor who's going to underplay the shit out of all of this. Right. Or it's just like, get to the thing. And right. that's what I feel mostly about the fucking Shelly and Vince stuff. Sure. Is it's just like, it's just, it's circling the same thing over and over again. And eventually you get to the point where you're just like, Vince, just go, man. <laughs> he like, he waffles about leaving the house for mm -hmm. so long. And Shelly, this seems very difficult for, for me to like navigate. Like Shelly's whole like, I don't want to be here. I want to be here forever. Yeah, what, what is Shelly's deal? What is her <laughs> deal, man? I don't get it. I don't really like Shelly or Vince. <laughs> I yeah, feel like, yeah. I don't know. I don't like his long monologue at the end. Um, oh, you mean the grad school audition monologue? Yes, the grad school, the Yale <laughs> He's drama. writing there. He's like, I'm a rock star <laughs> and every fucking 22 year old fucking like Yodel. 90 pound yes. 5 foot 11 boy is going to be saying this monologue because yeah. I'm so cool. Because I'm the a big coolest swig. guy ever. Yeah. He puts it away in a folder, seals it with a label that says for twink use only. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, basically, yeah. Yeah, he's like, I don't even want to do this, but yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. I'll take your award. Thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah, whatever. Anyway. Twist my so. arm, why don't yes. you? I'm going to flush it down my toilet. Yeah, Patty Smith was obsessed with me. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to leave town because I'm complicated. Uh, that's the vibe but yeah, yeah Shelly and Vince I don't know I didn't really um connect with her like it wasn't really fleshed out as much as the other family members but I guess they just represent someone who left and came back and they're like the city slickers right. you know and they're coming in and sort of judging the the home base kind of yeah but right. I'm, I'm wondering like okay so reading Sam Shepard now we like know that he's the great American playwright and everything and this is buried child and you know, we know so much about it even before reading it or like the idea of it, at least. And I feel like context is so important when you're experiencing plays like, but you have to understand this was written when nothing like this was ever done before. Yeah, so it's like, yeah. OK, yeah, I got to take that into account. I wonder what were the shock factors, you know, being an audience member in 1976 or whatever, because I remember when I was working on uh, Ibsen's Doll's House. <laughs> my director was like you have to understand she left her house like this right. was a shocker yeah, right, right, I was right, like yeah, oh yeah. okay yeah 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 most, crazy, most people yeah. walked out of that theater thinking that like the tragic story was Torvalds right yes. and it's like yeah. this guy's fucking wife left him can you fucking can you believe imagine? it yeah she's terrible yes uh burn her right that was the vibe Nora is serving belt yes um, so i feel like taking in the context um so i wonder so this was produced first in chicago in california i think oh, it was california. a it was a california yeah okay okay in 1976. J.O. Yeah. Saunders was in the original cast. But like it is very funny like reading reviews of the original production of Barry Child. Everyone was just kind of like, yeah, he sure did. Oh, so, <laughs> you know, so they were. He did that. They were blown away by it. I, in, think, in that I way? think there were certain aspects Someone of had it that to they be were. If he got well, right, right. right. I think certain aspects. I think certain aspects of it. But like everything I read was just kind of like it all. It all had like these caveats to it of mm. like. But I mean, yeah, because the thing. So is this like when Next to Normal won the Pulitzer, and everyone's like, "Are you really?" It's not. <laughs> it's not quite that because I think and there then were, Brian Yorkie is like, I, "I I have more work to do. I have to get every teenager in the country to kill themselves." <laughs> right, right. <laughs> they dare award me. Yeah. Forget thirteen reasons. I'll give them thirty six reasons. <laughs> yes. Three seasons, baby. Lots of lots of rape. Well, just we no will, reasons. <laughs> Zero reasons. We will. We will get. We will eventually get. To 13 we will get to Brian Yorkie and we will do things that we cannot legally say on this podcast. That's right, when we Brian. Get there. Yeah. But I, I do want to get back to the question that you were asking, Yuri, about like, is this portrayal here of these characters in the way that they sort of get into it? Is this like doing something that was at the time surprising? Like, yeah. do we do we think? My thought was that they're sort of how anachronistic they are in this world. Maybe what it's trying to do is to be like. Well, you thought you knew everything about the world of this play, didn't you? Well, guess again, motherfucker. Yeah. Here's some new guys. Well, they, yeah. Yeah. What, what my first thought was watching act two is mm. like, oh, these are two people who have lived in the real world now. 
and they're coming to this fake place. Sure. They are coming yeah. to this weird artificial universe that is this house, but they're real. And then uh, that's another note I just had to fucking cross out later because mm-hmm. I was like, mm-hmm. well, they're not real at all. They're no, they're, 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 less, they're yeah. less real, yeah. if anything. Yeah. So here's here's the thing is that Shepard is trying to tackle all of America sort of in one thing. And look, he himself would make fun of me for saying this because he was like people trying to like graft on the American family experience to this play is fine. It's not really what I was trying to do, but like, you know, go off, I guess. But (laughs) it seems like he is trying to go for like, okay, so we have the past. We have Dodge, right? We have the old West dying who committed literally named after a pickup truck. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. He, he, who has committed horrible atrocities in the name of like making sure his family can like, maintain itself right he's hauled yeah. multiple goats in his bed in the back bed of that dodge right yeah mm-hmm. oh good yeah. point see, see, yeah, what, see what i did there make yeah. the connection to yeah there you go yeah uh, and then you have back, anybody yeah no, it was good. No, it was good. That, was good. that was good hold on let us all take <laughs> a moment see, little little applause, Josh Borman, <laughs> for that wonderful bit uh <laughs> that is that is a callback uh yes, but yeah thank you but then aj w- did make a clapping motion <laughs> and it was totally silent i didn't want to get it i didn't want to get on the famous silent clap yeah, 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 yeah. And so then we see the ramifications of that on the second generation, right? The like, mm. well, uh, what would be considered like the old guard or what Sam Shepard would be a part of, right? It's the you're either uh, completely emasculated and turn into like a gibbering mess who has no idea, no purpose in life, who once upon a time went adventuring but found no fulfillment out in the real world and has had to return home, or you're a goddamn psychopath. Or you've killed yourself. Yeah. So those are sort of the three options that he lays out there, right? And then uh, you have the youths. It's what Sam Shepard is positing as the future of this country. The two youths. The two two youths youths. uh, (laughs) who similarly get stuck in mud at one point. Um, This is like what he is positing for the future, right? We have what he considers to be um, men who don't know who they are and who come back and aren't even recognized by the old guard who are screaming, I am with you. I am your family. And they're like, fuck you. Who the fuck are you? You aren't American. You aren't us. Mm. You're this fucking hippie. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. And then you also have women who are annoying. <laughs> I mean, yeah, kind of like because that's that's really the commonality, too, between uh, Hallie and Shelley. They're nags. Well, and maybe just... this is just because I'm a podcaster and therefore mm. very annoying myself. But sure. I thought of her as the only sympathetic character. Oh, Shelley's supposed she to is. be entirely. Yeah. yeah. But like, yeah, I, there's this weird thing where like Vince comes back. And he's very young, and he was there previously when he was a child. Yeah. And no one will claim to remember him at all. Sometimes they'll even pretend that he he and and the girl are just not even in the room. Mm-hmm. Right. Because they have their own little world going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But also, he has these very clear, distinct memories of them that don't seem to apply at all to the people we see on stage right yeah. not just in that wow they've changed a lot but it's like they've changed more than they should have in only seven years right yeah mm-hmm. no maybe it's like a self-portrait then maybe mm. vince and shelly are sam shepherd maybe because if he like mm. left mm. the farm life and went back to the city or it went to the city came back to the farm life and maybe it's like a fear that he has that no one will recognize him sure. or ever accept him or there's like stuff that he doesn't even know about his roots yeah. and uh i don't know like i'm assuming vince didn't like make it as a jazz musician but i don't know how hard was it back then really like, <laughs> <laughs> i don't know I he, was, he was white and can play a saxophone you know i think he would have been fine he was doing okay yeah yeah, yeah. he had a car right so <laughs> yeah he sure did but i i think that actually I think there is something to that. And it's something that I want to come back to a little bit later. Yeah. As we sort of see the culmination of Vince's arc that like such as it is, I yeah. think that there is a <laughs> piece abrupt. here where I don't know. Cause I, I never, i never talked to Sam Shepard. I don't know the guy, but it does seem to He's me, right here. Hey! <laughs> but it does seem to me like there are some insecurities of his own that he is putting into this character, into these characters. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Guilt. I'm feeling, yeah. I'm sensing yeah. some pan Christian guilt yes. here. Yes. <laughs> uh, Sam Shepard so. was pan, actually. That okay. is that is confirmed. Okay. Um. <laughs> pan 
Christian AJ. Yeah, that's what I what did you think I meant? Uh, oh, I'm gonna uh, hurt you. <laughs> uh, yeah. But it is interesting because he does spread a lot of his neuroses pretty much across every single guy that we see in the show. Yes. And uh, eventually gets to the point where his he Vince behaves much like Sam Shepard does, which is just like, I'm just gonna like Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. I'm going to go get my grandpa a bottle of whiskey uh, because his yeah, dad two bucks down the road, which is apparently a very long road because yeah. we're out in the, the Illinois countryside. Uh, the reason that he, he uh, Vince is so eager to get out of the house is because his own father, Tilden, turns out is not New Mexico, is here, right. does not recognize him at all and right. seems more interested in uh, peeling carrots. Yeah. With Shelly. With Shelly. With old Shelly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In a way that's kind of creepy. Mm-hmm. Very creepy. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily come off that way in the text so much, but this I, performance, I think, really drills that home. I think, yeah, that both both Dodge and Tilden are being a little creepy. Dodge and Tilden Shelley. are creepy, oh, yeah. but you can kind of tell at this point, I feel, that they're not going to hurt her. Like, they're harmless eccentrics. It's unclear. I feel yeah. like it's okay. in the air. Like, oh, are they going to? No, they wouldn't. Would they? They yeah, might. It's still definitely <laughs> yeah. insane from like Vince's perspective to just be like, yeah, I'm just going to leave her. Yeah. Her and the whole time I'm just yeah. like, Shelly, like, girl. Like, <laughs> get, get, get out, out of, of there. there. Yeah. I'm this like, is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, I was once in my 20s and I've been not in this situation, but, you know, I've been <laughs> in this situation. Not in Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> you've, never, you've never had to sit there. Uh, peeling carrots <laughs> while two weird guys stare at you. I'm yeah. sure something similar, but mm. yeah, no, I I don't peel my vegetables. Okay. There's lots okay. of fiber in the Got it. <laughs> yeah, skin. and that's so, a tip, folks. Yeah, Never peel your vegetables. You want that natural fiber you as part that. of your diet. Yes. Don't come to us and don't, say you never learned something. Yeah. Yeah. Don't say that at your audition for uh, Love Village. <laughs> 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 they they want right, a vegetable they need peeler. Wife. Yeah, 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 they need yeah, wife yeah. material. They really need that. I yeah, eat yeah. my banana peels. Yeah, no, <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, I just feel like Shelly, she's not in a good situation. I don't yeah. know why yeah. she's there, but I guess she's... I mean, at the end, she just gets fucked over because yeah, I'm yeah. not to skip ahead, but like Vince is just such a dick to her. Yeah. And I'm like, girl, yeah. you drove all the way here for this musician and <laughs> he doesn't even care you exist. Like, yeah, all of this for what? For what? I don't know. Well, it's... for the approval of two creeps watching her peel some vegetables. Yeah. Like and, and as she peels these vegetables, we, we sort of get closer and closer once again to the terrible secret. That's the the thing at the core of this play that keeps it ticking forward is like, when are we going to get the or it, it appears to be the thing that keeps the play ticking forward. It kind yeah. of actually isn't. It's no, a little it's bit of sort a, of a false thing we go back to. But we just keep <laughs> yeah. coming back to, well, who or what is the titular buried child? Mm-hmm. And, yeah. uh, you know, Tilden gets pretty worked up, actually, uh, about what's going on here and, mm. you know, talks about his memories of, of this child. I want to know, like, more about Tilden and H- Holly or Haley's relationship. Like, what was that? Like, what happened? Was it one time? Like, was it a thing? Like, I have my head cannon about it, but like, yeah, you no, know, go for and, it. like, who's Vince's mother? Where did where did that come from? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That that's left entirely unanswered. And, Other- and there there even seems to be an implication that that Ansel, our boy Ansel Adams, the 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 documenter of America, the the one who died in the motel, that Dodge is his father, but Haley Hallie is not his mother. Like there's there's points where they talk about her like pictures of her holding the child and like and and the pointedness of my flesh and blood as well, kind of relating back to that. Yeah. Where where she has this kid that wasn't her flesh and blood, but she uh-huh. raised anyway. And actually maybe he was her favorite of all the kids. Yeah. I see. Yeah. 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 Including even the one that, you know, she had sex with. Oh, uh, because of the self loathing. Well, yeah. There's so much. It's like every, every corner. <laughs> There's so much self loathing. Yeah. It, it's, it's so interesting because I just, I don't, you know, the the incest stuff is so, like, subtly referenced throughout the whole thing that, like, it's really hard to get a timetable on it. But for me, it's just like, I think it was probably after after Ansel killed himself that she was like, I will not lose another son. Sure. I need to be as close to that son as possible. Yeah. Ugh. And Dodge isn't helping with this. So I'm going to make another kid whether Dodge Ugh. wants it or not. I see. I see. And it's going to be with my own son, which is also going to further like. Because she's fucking Ansel, right? She's right. using Tilden, who is, as we've seen, kind of more simple minded. Yeah. In order to like fuck her own dead Ugh. son. Yeah. Is sort of the implication right, 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 in her right. grief. Ugh. 
Yeah, that that's my that's my head canon well. about it. But again, that that's none of that's really like that, that's just inference from the script. Right, like they right, never yeah, explicitly yeah. say any of that. But that's what has always made most sense to but, me. But here's what does explicitly happen at the end of Act Two. Shelley is hanging out with Tilden and peeling carrots, and we get this back and forth. Do you do much driving now? Now, N- now, no, I don't drive now. How come? I'm older. You're not that old. I'm not a kid. You don't have to be a kid to drive. It wasn't driving then. What was it? Adventure. I went everywhere. I I had a sensation of myself. Well, you can still do that. Not now. Why not? I just told you. You don't understand. If I told you something, you wouldn't understand it. Told me what? Told you something that's true. Like what? Like a baby? Like a little tiny baby. Like when you were little? If I told you, you'd make me give your coat back. I won't. I promise. Tell me. Please. I I can't. Dodge won't let me. He won't hear you. It's okay. He's watching TV. We had a baby. Little baby. Could pick it up with one hand, put it in the other. So small, nobody could find it. Just disappeared. We had no service, no him, nobody came. Tilden! Cops looked for it, neighbors, nobody could find it. Tilden, you leave that girl alone, she's completely innocent. Finally, everybody just gave up, just stopped looking. Everybody had a different answer. Tilden, what are you telling her? Little tiny baby just disappeared, it's not hard, it's just, it's so small, almost invisible, hold it in one hand. Tilden, don't tell her anything, she's an outsider. He's the only one who knows where it is. The only one, like a secret buried treasure. Won't tell any of us. Now, you probably want your coat back now. I-, I would if I was you. And at this point, things are just silent. Yeah. Because Tilden has sort of come closer to revealing the core of this horrible secret. And at this point, Bradley enters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Tilden, leading right up into this moment, was talking about how he liked to drive around New Mexico and go to places where you know you're not supposed to be, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you see things that you know you're not supposed to see. Right. And right. and when he just she asks him and he just says, "Oh, animals, people." But you're not supposed yeah. to see. You're you're. I mean, I think this is a, a true experience of just about anywhere in this country. But like, you can very easily just do that. You just go in a straight line in New Mexico, and then you're out someplace where it's the darkest it's ever been. Yeah. Or the right. moon is the brightest you've ever seen it. Right. And you just start to see things. Yeah. And you think maybe I shouldn't be out here. Yeah, sure. I mean, we literally built the atom bomb out there. We have whole towns that people weren't supposed to see. Right, (laughs) right, right. right. I think it's also that like that can also imply about the trouble that he got into down in New Mexico, that he was kind of a peeping Tom. Well, apparently in earlier drafts of it. Uh, at one point, I think Tilden explicitly, it, it was made explicit in the script that he had like molested somebody or, or gotten into that kind yeah. of trouble specifically. Yeah. Yeah. I oh, think that yeah. making it so that what kind of trouble he got into, uh, having that be unclear is actually a very strong choice. This is also yeah. at the time where the idea of getting arrested in New Mexico is particularly terrifying. Mm. Uh, the prison in Santa Fe was like the most densely populated prison in the world or at least the developed world oh wow it was this very underbuilt prison that was just packed full of people uh, and actually in the very beginning of 1980 so it's already at like full saturation in 79 people have to sleep on the floors just all next to each other and all these dormitories and everything and and then there was this massive riot huh. that led to incredible amounts of of death and violence and and then the national guard having to be called in to like invade the prison and take it back from this huge mass of prisoners that just rose up it sounds terrible i mean brian you were filming something at a prison I in filmed new mexico at that prison oh yeah. wow oh, and wow. it was still fucking awful it's, it's a it's a wretched place they built the new prison across the street from it i was at the old prison built uh, with bricks from my hometown wow. with, oh my with the name Gallup right. stamped on the brick itself like the one I have on that table over right. there. Haunted. Wow. And and yeah, we were all wearing orange jumpsuits and we had to have a PA with us every time so that a guard wouldn't think that we... Cause, you were actual prisoners. Because they would have prison prisoners working over at the old prison. Wow. Like on the other side of the fence, but also like 
NBC just owns one of those buildings and uses it as a studio. What? <laughs> <laughs> this is so fucked. And, and, yeah. and, and, and yeah. I think it all like speaks to you had mentioned this as well, AJ, like just the violence that is core and endemic to what this country is. Yes. Yeah. And I think that in the play, that violence or at least the tip of the spear, the physical violence is most directly represented by the character of Bradley. Right. Yeah. And, and big old Bradley. And so, you know, we mentioned him uh, at the end of the first act where we just see him uh, shaving his dad's hair and cutting yeah. him. But now we really see what this guy's deal mm -hmm. is. And it's fucked. Uh, yeah. He comes in and he immediately is alpha male like Tilden cowers in fear of him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like he com he completely breaks down and then runs away as his sort of his his M.O. Uh, and he. It, things get really scary with him and Shelly yeah. just by themselves, and uh, he forces his fingers into her mouth. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And that's how the act ends. My friend was talking about auditioning for Bradley because there was a company doing Barry Child down in Virginia, mm. and he was just like, there's no audition side that you can do for Bradley because the one big scene he has is either in the big group scene or he's sticking his fingers right. into Shelly's mouth. And there's not a lot of lead up to that yeah. moment. Uh -huh. Like there's not a lot of lines. Bradley is not a very verbose character. No, right? Weirdly for a Sam Shepard play. Yeah. <laughs> That's so interesting about violence. I feel like, yeah, all the men in the play display some sort of violence. Uh, Vince with the bottles, Bradley throughout. I'm trying to think, did Tilden do anything violent? Maybe not Tilden. And I guess with yeah. Dodge, you don't see him commit any act of violence, but mm -mm. you definitely see it in your head. Right. Yeah, you know it was right. there. He's just not able to do it anymore because right. he's got yeah. the dying disease. Yeah. Yes, the, the dying disease. The, the violence might disease. be implied with Tilden with the trouble in New Mexico. That's so true. You're that's like, true. Oh, okay. That's true. Okay, yeah. That's yeah. true. Yes, yes. So, and then the women, I don't know what's their default just like to leave. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Stay to leave, until they don't want to stay To anymore. ignore, to, I mean, obviously, Com commit a form of sexual violence on mm -hmm. on the part of, of Hallie, but yeah. as far as Shelly is concerned, she throws a cup at one point. That's true. <laughs> oh yes. Yeah. Okay. So so it, the men don't listen to her until she starts speaking in their language, which yeah. is violence. That's true. It is fucked, but like that's the only way that she asserts any power in those things. Because at the end of Act Two, she loses all of her power. Yeah. Right. And then Act Three starts, and she's. Fine yeah. and still there yeah, and making beef more, bouillon. Morning is coming and then and she's just making like bouillon in a cup. So this is this Dodge. is this is a question that I had uh, for you, Yuri, because this is like a character acting moment where in the text it really does kind of read as if she's basically fine from the night before. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, but did you read it that way, or because it, part of it too is like again we watched that production and in that production that actress is very much playing it like she's fine yeah but do you it, think and, and that that act ends with her kind of breaking right and then taking a couple steps away and sort of maintaining sort of a powerful posture right and then it yeah. cuts to yeah this yeah. what did you find in this well i was trying to justify like her staying for so long right especially yeah. after the finger incident like that's a that's a really strong cue to you should probably go. get out of there yeah. yeah but she sticks around and i think there is some kind of um unhealthy curiosity mm -hmm. and like an attraction that is existing in this space yeah. for Shelly that maybe she hasn't been exposed to being from the big city or whatever, more progressive, more modern. And her man is a musician. So that implies a softer, more like sensible, I don't know, being. And then I'm not saying she was turned on <laughs> by the hand in mouth, but if I were playing Shelly, I would definitely try to sit in that mm. yeah yeah that's the way it makes sense to me in my head yeah like, yeah it is it is like there is something about being around this like power that they mm. hold you yeah. know that like she wants to like take in herself also i think it's just not very well written no i'm sorry yeah. it's just like as an actor you have to like bend over backwards to justify this stuff right. but shelly just doesn't work as I, a character i, I me. Yeah. think yeah the biggest issue is that textually she says that she leaves the house mm -hmm. like in act three. And so I think the solution there is to actually stage that we're like 
fingers happens. If you're gonna have a break before you you kill the lights, have her have run her actually out. leave. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then the the sun comes back up, and she's kind of making her way back in. Right, right. Because right. for whatever reason, I guess she's just seen that Dodge has not hurt her. And she feels bad for him because he's got the dying disease. Yeah. yeah. She, she ran out and masturbated. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, again, yeah. Like if, if you just make it more fucked up, then it works. Yeah. 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 It's kind of got to have that fool for love thing where yeah. it's just like, yeah, these are two little freaks. Yeah. <laughs> Be real freaky about yeah. it. Maybe Vince isn't doing it for her. I don't know. Maybe something's missing. I don't know. Mm. But well, I mean, he's she spending all the time forth, fingering yeah. a saxophone and not, yeah. you know. Yeah. Also, yeah. Vince isn't back. It's morning. Right. He's just not back. Yeah. Because he's Seems having weird. an entire arc off stage, I guess. Yeah. He <laughs> Don't really worry about is. It. I was like, why is he so upset? Well, I guess no one knew who he was. Yeah, he comes back like really mad, but like, why didn't he leave that mad? You know, I don't like know. He's, no one knows who you are and you're angry and you're gonna go to the liquor store super angry, then be angry on the way. Well it's off. cause he's drunk, Brian, and so when he had the drink, it made him get mad, I think. Yeah. I don't know. I, we'll, I, think, we'll, I think that is the We'll I think get that to Vince's the, return yeah. in a little bit. Right now what I want return to talk about is how Shelly, uh, after sort of having a, a nice question mark uh <laughs> moment where, you know, she's talking to Dodge until then things are sort of relaxed. Then all of a sudden, Hallie shows up again, mm. and she is not fucking happy yeah. to see another woman in her house. She left the house wearing black because she was talking to the the pastor ostensibly to get like a memorial to Ansel built right. up. Mm-hmm. And uh, now <laughs> she's come back with yellow flowers, and she's wearing like a yellow, a yellow floral outfit. dress. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, she and the pastor are both drunk. Yeah. And uh, the pastor is like, hey, if you want any more whiskey, just like reach in my back pocket. Yeah. And, and he's then like, it's, it's like, like, oh, it's like, oh, this is Yeah. And all this is happening in front of Dodge. And so Dodge is then like getting up close with Shelly and being like, I also have right, right, right. a paramour. And Shelly's yeah. like, I didn't, I don't want this. <laughs> <laughs> I never, I never asked She's this. just drinking bullion out of a teacup yeah. that that then Hallie like pours whiskey into mm-hmm. and that just sounds like the worst <laughs> thing that you could ever thing. drink in yeah. your life mixed with uh, whiskey no yeah. thank you the thing that kept hitting my ear in this one is I just they keep using the phrase Judas Priest a yeah. lot and I'm like hardcore Sam <laughs> hard fucking core but uh, how do we feel sort of about the return of Hallie and also her relationship with this weird fucking pastor. I mean, it, it's very clearly You're asking us to talk about women in a Sam Shepard play. And we're, it's, you know, it's a <laughs> shallow pool. <laughs> it is. I mean, I guess it's just, uh, so if we're looking at the American dream and yeah. just how delicate it is and how it's not really built on anything healthy or sustainable, putting religion into the mix, there's no faith in anything at this point. Cause she's not only, cheating on Dodge right in front of him. Yeah. It's almost like she wants to get a reaction out of him, Mm -hmm. I feel like. Mm -hmm. And not just with anyone, but with a reverend, like a minister, whatever that is. Yeah. Um, Yeah, seems so just losing faith in any sort of structure uh, as the writer. Like, I feel like Yeah, any institution at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everyone who's like proclaiming, well, it used to be better when we had religion. And it's like, Mm -hmm. yeah, but look at the religious practitioner. He's a lecherous, you know, drunk old man. There's even a line they added for the revised version where the where the priest is like, uh, because they're arguing over whether Ansel was a basketball player or not, because Bradley's like, he didn't play basketball. And he's (laughs) like, he was a great basketball player. (laughs) And the priest says, oh, I wouldn't know. I was spending most of my time with the boys choir uh, that was added for the revised edition it's like oh okay, okay. so he's a pedophile okay, sure, too sure, 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 sure. Cool, cool cool I guess they, they have that in common um, yes. he and Hallie oh, they, uh, could, they bonded over they bonded yeah, yeah, over yeah. that um, yeah it's, it's a fun play folks it's a fun, <laughs> it's a fun play uh, that's all we're, American just real bright sunny stuff here I, 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 we'll <laughs> get to the sun Josh <laughs> everyone was feeling great it was the 70s they were all breathing lead I think there's something to be said here too about the I don't know, the declining role of the church in American life. Yeah. yeah and how definitely. sort of like the church has become it, and it we're and how no, observable that is to a baby boomer. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. The fact that like, you know, post war things were still so clearly structured around everything was structured around the church. Yeah. And by the time we get to the late seventies, you know, we have had uh, widely available contraception. We've had other ways of like uh, being gay is starting to become a thing that people are 
at least aware of, if mm-hmm. not tolerant oh, by of. By 79, yeah, it, it, there's such a sort of backwards turn that happens in right, the 80s. Right. But like by 79, it's, a, it's just like uh, in, a, in the big cities, in places where Sam Shepard lives, right. like it's just, yeah, there we go. A backwards turn is exactly right. It is the reactionary turn. Yeah. What yeah. we are seeing here is sort of. I, oh, a, 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 no. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. God damn it. What we're seeing yeah. here is in this character, the character of fucking what the hell is that guy's name? The the, the minister. Dewis. Uh, Father Dewis. Father Dewis. <laughs> um, basically, Dewis, he is the church trying to come back in and once again assert itself. But at this point, the church has become a fucking parody of itself and it's going to get even more so. Yeah, so the only way you assert yourself is just by fucking somebody's wife. Yeah. 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 And then like when we we get to, Sam Shepard can't see this yet, obviously, because we're not there. But once we get to the fucking 80s and we get the moral majority in the way that the evangelical right is going to link arms with these fucking freaks, it's going to become even more of a parody of itself. And who is really the big engine of the moral majority not the leaders but the actual on the ground support it's the yeah. baby boomers yeah and we'll right. get to more of that when when vince returns yeah <laughs> but yeah no you're 100 right and actually uh oh my god hallie uh <laughs> hallie actually has a line that says the youth are monsters the yes. youths are turning into monsters and i think what this play posits is like yes they are, but it's your fucking fault. Well, but and it's also like the monster that they're turning into is their parents, is yeah, the people right, that we you, see in the house. Right, right, you, right. They're transforming back into you. It's Spider Man pointing at Spider Man because you can't escape. You can't escape family. Yeah, as yeah. much as you want to, it's going to pull you back, and you will become your parents. Yeah. I'm I'm also curious, Yuria, for you, like, given that, you know, you have your, your dad is American, mm-hmm. but you did not grow up in the United States. Mm-hmm. How much of this cultural stuff do you really have a level of personal experience with, I guess? Like, mm-hmm. how much of it have you seen for yourself versus like just sort of, I guess, observing it maybe more secondhand? Yeah, I can think of some some examples Um my childhood, so I grew up in Japan, but every year, every Christmas, we would go to New York because my dad is from New York. Oh, okay. He's, he's from okay. an hour north of the city. And that's where, okay. like, my aunt and uncle and, like, cousins are um, from that side of the family. So I would visit them. And my cousin's family is so different from my family. <laughs> and one thing I always felt like was... It was a very like Febreze type of family. Like maybe everything isn't clean, but it's going to smell clean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> that's Dude, so Feb- that's is, is Febreze great... family a Yuri original? I like that. A that's going to stick with me. Really? Yeah, yeah I just thought yeah. of it. Like I a Febreze that. family. Because my mother, so she's the Japanese one, but mm-hmm. ethnically, she's technically Korean. And oh, okay. they're okay. like mm-hmm. hot blooded people. Um, <laughs> and so when my mom has something to say and, you know, she needed to scold me or whatever she would do it no matter where we were and it was just very that Mm -hmm, type of mm -hmm. vibe and then my white cousins like it always felt like there was something underneath the surface like you enter Mm. the room and you're like is everyone okay? Yeah. Like, no, yeah. but they're going to smile and be like, oh, it's yeah. fine. And just like. Sure is a lot of subtext in the room right now. Yes. <laughs> just like, wow, big pours of wine. Just yeah. Giant, yeah. giant glasses of wine. People and, saying pass the salt through gritted teeth. Yeah, <laughs> like it was very, it was so different. And so when we ate family style, my, my family, like in Japan, we're just like, you know, picking off of plates. It's not a big deal. But mm-hmm. like my cousin's family, like if you touch someone else's plate with their fries it was just kind of like mm. we don't do that mm-hmm. they yeah, yeah, cross yeah. some kind of boundary mm-hmm. so there's all these like weird rules that i wasn't used to and one time we both of our families we went to disney world together and um my mom like i love my mom okay she's not a violent person however <laughs> she, did, she did smack me in public one time at disney world oh my god because yeah, oh I, was, I was being a bitch i'm sure i deserved it i was uh, horrible angsty teenage years you know um because of oh, well, you and everything. Yeah. Wow. I was like, you don't get it mom and yeah, no, dad you, yeah. you yeah. had to go and make things so complicated in that moment exactly yeah. thank yeah. you yeah. so much yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. yeah this had to be post 2001 obviously because avril lavigne Yes, it was like 2000. Yeah. So I was like a a young teenager and my mom smacked me at Disney World (laughs) and my aunt was just kind of like, 
you can't do that in public. <laughs> I'm just imagining like a hundred feet away, there's like Goofy and he's like taking pictures with people and just goes, Gorsh. Gorsh, yeah. But, but I, to that point, I think it's like it, the American way is, yeah, you don't do that in public. You do it in you private. Do it yeah, like, yeah. so I just felt like there were things that weren't addressed. Yeah. That there yeah. was this pressure and expectation mm. to maintain some kind of composure. And the Norman Rock- Rockwell painting reference that Shelley makes, just like the picture yeah. perfect. Mm-hmm. The apple pies. Yes, yeah. like that. But I was like, you guys need to talk some stuff yeah. out. <laughs> well, and, and, and that's yeah. that's where this family finds itself, too, in this yeah. third act. Because the they whole are, thing is that they have not talked about exactly. the thing. Yeah. Every right. single one of them wants to talk about it. But Hallie is like, we can't fucking talk about it. Don't yeah, you it's, dare. It's all Basically driven by her. Yeah. She is the yeah. one who has decreed that it won't be talked about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it seems, I don't think they say it outright again, but it's, it seems like she was the one who made the order sort of to, to, to slaughter the child. Right. That, that, well, yeah. I mean, Dodge, although it, it could have been that Dodge just did it on but, his own but too. Either, like, but yeah. either way, yeah. I mean, it makes sense that she would be the one who is saying they can't talk about it because it was her child. Yeah. And yeah. she was also the one who fucking raped her own son. You know, mm-hmm. like yeah. it's yeah. There, there's a talk that Tilden and Dodge have in Act One where uh, Tilden's like, I don't understand why we just don't talk about it. And Dodge says, well, you know, it's different for her. You know, it was like her baby. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, which is our first in, in you know inclination that it was not Dodge's. Uh, but it, yeah, it seems like she is just constantly trying to talk so she won't hear the buzzing in her head that's saying uh. this is all your fault, right? And to your point, Yuri, about like not talking about things and having it come out sort of in other ways and like bigger explosions later, mm. the house itself around them is rotting because they've pushed this thing so far down that it's physically affecting the world around them. Right. They've put this dead child in the earth and now it has reached up through the earth and is rotting their house from the inside yeah. out. And the only way they can get rid of it is by actually acknowledging it, which they finally do. Yeah. Am I reading into this too much? The line I read earlier with Hallie's line, she's like, I'm not unaware of the world around me. Mm. I don't know, around, I'm like, you're not in the world. I feel like she's removed herself from the world. Well, it's like Dodge Dodge talks about that with the house, where it's like, don't go out of the house. The house is is like everything. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, again, they've, they've created their own world. Right. And once you step outside of that house, you're in a different, you're on a different planet. Yeah. Yeah. And so finally, after all of this back and forth, you know, Shelly gets to the point where she's just fucking had enough of all of this. She finally, finally took her long enough. Yeah. Uh, She fucking, you know, grabs Bradley's leg. Yeah. uh, And and just holds on to it. It's like, you know, I got your leg, bitch. Uh, She takes the power, right? And and that's that's when he starts Mm -hmm. just screaming and crying and calling for his mother. Right. Mm -hmm. Because she shouldn't be allowed to do this, but also no one steps in. The only thing left to do is to tell the story. So in this scene, Shelly has pushed the whole family to its limit. Dodge has decided that he's finally going to just spill the beans about what happened. (laughs) She thinks she's going to get it out of us. She thinks she's going to uncover the truth of the matter like a detective or something. I'm not telling her anything. Nothing's wrong here. Nothing's ever been wrong. Everything's the way it's supposed to be. Nothing ever happened that's bad. Everything is all right here. We're all good people. We've always been good people right from the very start. She thinks she's going to suddenly bring everything out into the open after all these years. Can't you see that these people want to be left in peace? Don't you have any mercy? They haven't done anything to you. She wants to get to the bottom of it. That's it, isn't it? You'd like to get right down to bedrock. Look the beast right dead in the eye. You want me to tell you. You want me to tell you what happened. I'll tell you. I might as well. I wouldn't mind hearing it in the air after all these years of silence. No, don't listen to him. He doesn't remember anything. I remember the whole thing from start to finish. I remember the day he was born. Dodge, if you tell this thing, if you tell this, you'll be dead to me. You'll be just as good as dead. That won't be such a big change, Hallie. See, this girl, this little girl here, she wants to know. She wants to know something more, and I got this feeling that it doesn't make a bit of difference. 
I'd sooner tell it to a stranger than anybody else. I'd sooner tell it to the four winds. We made a pact. We made a pact between us. You can't break that now. I don't remember any pact. See, we were a well-established family once. Well-established. All the boys were grown. The farm was producing enough milk to fill Lake Michigan twice over. Me and Hallie here were pointed toward what looked like the middle part of our life. Everything was settled with us. All we had to do was ride it out. Then Hallie got pregnant again. Out of the middle of nowhere, she got pregnant. We weren't planning on having any more boys. We had enough boys already. In fact, we hadn't even been sleeping in the same bed for about six years. I'm not listening to this. I don't have to listen to this. Where are you going? Upstairs? You'll just be listening to it upstairs. You go outside, you'll be listening to it outside. Might as well stay here and listen to it. Hallie had this kid. See? This baby boy, she had it. I let her have it on her own. All the other boys I had had the best doctors, the best nurses, everything. This one, I let her have by herself. This one hurt real bad. Almost killed her, but she had it anyway. It lived. See, it lived. It wanted to grow up in this family. It wanted to be just like us. It wanted to be part of us. It wanted to pretend that I was its father. She wanted me to believe in it. Even when everyone around us knew, everyone, all our boys knew, Tilden knew. You shut up. Bradley, make him stop. I can't. Tilden was the one who knew. Better than any of us. He'd walk for miles with that kid in his arms. Hallie let him take it. All night sometimes, he'd walk all night out there in the pasture with it. Talking to it. Singing to it. Used to hear him singing to it. (laughs) He'd make up stories. He'd tell that kid all kinds of stories, even when he knew it couldn't understand him. We couldn't let a thing like that continue. We couldn't allow that to grow up right in the middle of our lives. It made everything we'd accomplished look like it was nothing. Everything was canceled out by this one mistake, this one weakness. So you... I killed it. I drowned it. Just like the runt of a litter. Just drowned it. There was no struggle, no noise. Life just left it. This is a classic Sam Shepard thing where a guy's like, okay, here's my whole deal and it's going to go on for a few pages. Like Fool for Love is just like, okay, the last five pages of this thing are just one big monologue. Yeah, Yeah. Uh, Let him talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably probably let my man cook. The best example of this is probably in the movie Paris, Texas, which he wrote part of at the beginning and then came back at the end and Kit Carson and Vim Vendors kind of filled out the middle uh, Right, where you, you have this one really long monologue mm-hmm. that is again about someone who cannot resist his impulses mm-hmm. and is sort of committing this final act of love and mercy in saying goodbye to someone that he, he knows he would hurt again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, spoilers. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like, this is something that Sam Shepard is always, always doing in all of his mm-hmm. plays. He's like, okay, we're going to have someone just t- tell you the whole life now. Well, Josh has been uh, referring to the script as the libretto. Man, uh, leave me alone. I'm tired. No, 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 no. But I actually, little baby. No, no, but I think, I actually <laughs> think that it's a very interesting insight because Sam Shepard, as we talked about, viewed most of his plays as music, mm. right? And so these big, long monologues do kind of feel like the monologue you would send your songwriter if you were writing a libretto being mm. like, hey, we need a solo here. Here's the solo. Sure. Uh-huh. Right. It's like Sam Shepard is writing musical theater. It just we never got a composer. Well, here's a question that I have for you, Yuri, because obviously you at the beginning of the episode, we're talking about how you, you know, did the monologue to get into acting school and all that. Yeah. How does engaging with this text feel for you as an actor? Well, okay, I'm just going to say I don't like Meisner, so I never use Meisner. Okay. Ooh. You never use Meisner? You never use Meisner? You never use Meisner? You never use Meisner. Meisner. You never use Meisner. You never use Meisner. Well, obviously, I had to use Meisner because it was forced upon me uh, in school. But no, I never really got the whole... Well, here goes nothing. I hope something happens. I hope I feel something. It, yeah, a lot of yeah. it felt left up to chance mm. 
to me anyway, I wanted always like a set of tools that I could reach into and be mm. like, for this, I think I'm going to use this. For this, I'm going to use this. Um, it was like repeatable and very much like a craft that you perfect, you know, not just like, because for so many years I was like, well, here goes nothing. I hope right. I feel <laughs> in yeah. this scene. Do you think the text gave you that? Or uh, when I did the monologue originally. Yeah. Or just for Sam Shepard in general. Like, can you find that thing in there or does it end up being like, oh, I don't know if I can en engage this really. Like, does it sing for you in that way? I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I, I would never um, say otherwise. I feel like if it's human, it should be playable. Um, that's like. Ideally. <laughs> yeah. Unless it's dancer and then it's impossible. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> yeah. OK, let's say. If I was playing Shelly, yeah. I mean, playing Hallie seems like probably more of a rewarding uh, actor's experience, but I don't know if it's as fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you do get it, to read all your lines, theoretically, for, yeah, like for, the, for the first, first time. That's true. You're totally yeah. gonna have to get off book for that shit. <laughs> if I were Hallie, I mean, I would have to do some Adler and imagine a reality that has never happened mm. and try to get as yeah. specific as possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. What I take away from her is like, what is it? Living truthfully under imaginary circumstances. Yeah. Yes. So things that really trigger me in a good way, <laughs> you want to get triggered as an actor, right? Mm -hmm. It's like so specific. I remember, sorry to bring up Doll's House so many times, but this was in scene study. It wasn't yeah. me. I was watching. Yeah, the door slam heard around the world. Yeah. Yes. And so this actor, she was working on the final monologue that Nora gives where she's like I'm leaving you know yeah. and she wasn't quite connecting and my acting teacher he was just kind of like okay you're leaving your children she was like yeah okay um, can you please hold your baby hmm. and like she like held her baby and she just started weeping oh, wow. <laughs> and cause yeah. she had to he was like I want you to say goodbye Huh. to your baby. So like little suggestive things like this, it's like finding the right surface for the match, yeah. right? Just to strike the flame. Um, mm. So for Hallie, I don't know what that will be, <laughs> <laughs> well, but something like holding the baby, yeah, telling yeah. Dodge, these things that you would have to flesh out that must have happened that mm -hmm. isn't written, but you right. have to fill in the blanks, right? Um, yeah, it so was, yeah. was like Hallie there to watch the baby be drowned? Did he do sure, it in the middle of the sure, night? Sure. Did, tell yeah. anyone? did she hear anything? Well, he said it didn't make any noise, but like, did she hear any splashing? Did right. she hear... Oh my God, how did she find out? Yeah, that's a yeah, big thing. And yeah. also, what does it mean that she had the baby on her own? Did she just like deliver this baby? <laughs> or yeah. she asked a, great question. a friend? Yeah. Like, I mean, it that? might have been told him too, you know? True. Part of the great fun of living on a farm is yeah. those farm births. I mean, yeah. that that's, uh, you know, my, my mom, her family lived on a farm when she was born. She was born in a doctor's office. But one of her brothers was like, yeah, one of those things where my grandmother started getting to labor. They mm -hmm. had to find their neighbor who had the car. And yeah. by the time they got the car, she had given birth. Wow. Holy wow. shit. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, it is it is one of those things, too. Like immediately after this, we see that Hallie says uh, she starts yelling at Bradley and saying Ansel wouldn't have let him drown the baby. Ansel would have done all this. Yeah. And you start getting this insight into why the fuck Bradley is the way he is. Yeah. Which is just like not uh, Ansel. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Because he's just Tilden. not. Yeah. 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 Or <laughs> Tilden. Right. And that he is that he was all the burden of being like the masculine like form was put into this one guy and how that poisons the mind of these of these guys to turn them into these psychopaths, to turn yeah. them into these sociopaths. No wonder he's so angry. Yeah, he, can, he can't be the hero. He's like yeah. private pile. He just didn't get mommy's yeah. love. He was probably cha training with that chainsaw to, you know, attack some poor tourists for mommy. Yeah. <laughs> and it took off half his leg. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> the interesting thing, though, here is that the play is not over yet. No, no. Uh, well, the secret's out. The secret's, secret's out. out, and Vince returns. Vince returns, and this is the button. This is like where, where I guess the point of the play is being brought in, because like the big reveal is the big reveal, and it's right. big and shocking and dramatic. But does it say anything? <laughs> or, or, or is it maybe some kind of MacGuffin of sorts? Right. Because Vince shows up, he throws a bunch of bottles, as we mentioned. He's incredibly angry. He's had a whole journey in between when he left, which and when we he did came not back. get to see. Any of them. No, and I guess he explains it, but it doesn't really make sense. But no. he yeah. talks about, yeah, going driving again. 
going driving and just like seeing himself in the mirror. Yeah, AJ, did you want to read this one? Sure. If, I'll, I wanna, if you want to, no, that's the question. I like, want to all audition for grad school. You want to audition for grad school with this one? <laughs> yeah, at the end, you all just tell me if I'm yell or not, all right? All right, here we go. All right. What happened to you, Vince? You just disappeared. I was going to run last night. I was going to run and keep right on running, clear to the Iowa border. Drove all night with the windows open. The old man's two bucks flapping right on the seat beside me. It never stopped raining the whole time. It never stopped once. I could see myself in the windshield. My face, my eyes. I, I studied my face. Studied everything about it as though I was looking at another man, as though I could see his whole race behind him, like a mummy's face. I saw him dead and alive at the same time, in the same breath. In the windshield, I watched him breathe as though he was frozen in time, and every breath marked him, marked him forever, without him knowing. And then his face changed. His face became his father's face. Same bones, same eyes, same nose, same breath. And his father's face changed to his grandfather's face, and it went on like that, changing. Clear on back to faces I'd never seen before, but still recognized. Still recognized the bones underneath. Same eyes, same mouth, same breath. I followed my family clear to Iowa. Every last one. Straight into the corn belt and further, straight back as far as they'd take me. Then it all dissolved. Everything dissolved. <laughs> Just like that. And that two bucks kept right on flapping on the seat beside me. Boy, whatever he's smoking... <laughs> I'll oh. have three. <laughs> Should I get into Yale? Yeah, yeah, you're in. <laughs> yeah. Also, like, the two bucks, there must have been something on the two dollars, right? Right, it had to be <laughs> way down. Yeah. 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 That really bothers yeah. me. I can't focus. I'm like, wait, yeah. No, well, they all on there. <laughs> like, stick it on there. I, I guess I like it in a literary sense when it's by itself. Mm, I don't right. think it needs to be there in the play yeah. because this, this theme of him becoming his family actually illustrates pretty clearly in all of the other lines of dialogue. Right, well, he's not <laughs> drunk, right? Yeah, you know, right, right. He's plastered when he comes back, so he's already inherited the alcoholism. Right. And, He you takes know, Dodge's seat on the couch. Yeah, the cap and his cap. On. He yeah. puts his cap on. Like, yeah, he, he kind of... Sort of pretends not to recognize people in the same way that ignores Shelly and Shelly, especially. And so yes. she's just like, yeah, fucking bye. Okay. Can, wait, can you read this last line of Shelly's? Because I think it's I think it's sure. a wildly bad piece of writing because <laughs> we have that whole monologue. Right. Yeah, yeah, Which yeah. I think is a great piece of like literature. Like yeah. it, it feels this is like the Sam Shepard play where do. he does the Sam Shepard monologue twice. <laughs> yeah, he does. OK, Shelly's line. Yeah. Bye, Vince. I can't hang around for this. I'm not even related. <laughs> we know, Shelly! We know! It's just, it's so insane Someone walked to up me. to him after, the, after seeing the Absolutely. show and was like, so was Shelly actually related to that them? Must, like that, one, yeah, that, that must have been what happened. There was a point right? in the course of the been. show where I was like, what's going to happen here? Is he right, a ghost? Right, is he not right, real? Right. Is he the buried child? Is she related? Is is she like his sister and he doesn't right, know it? Right, right. Like August of Sage can Spice! Or fool for love. <laughs> yeah. But like So he's like, oh, I guess I gotta make it clear. Yeah, that yeah, she's yeah, yeah. not really. Mm. Yeah, because mm. minus that, one incest on this one. That, yeah. that original line is so great because it's that whole monologue, and then Shelly goes, Bye Vince, Bye, and Vince. is gone. Yeah. yeah. Well, but but let's let's talk about the substance of that monologue for a moment if we yeah, can. Sure. Because this is paying off. I think what the ultimate idea at the heart of this play is or the question it's asking, yeah, yeah. which is, can you outrun your past? And specifically, can you outrun America? Yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, to what extent does the way that your family, your, your, your own actual family, as well as your 
family of fellow Americans, right? To what extent does that affect the person who you are and the person who you become? Uh, There is a line earlier in this play where Tilden is talking to Shelley and uh, Tilden is saying, like, I thought I recognized something about Vince, despite the fact that Tilden has very explicitly said he does not recognize his own son, right? In Tilden's line is, I thought I saw a face inside his face. Mm. Yeah. And that pays off here in this part as well. No, no, I really, I really like that idea. It's, it plays in my mind like a horror movie. It's one of those like very evocative pieces of writing where you're just like, you see it happen in your mind's eye and it's fucking freaky, man. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, again, on its own. But I think once it gets applied theatrically and it's sitting there in the middle of this much longer scene mm-hmm. and he's just a guy who's come and sit down that you you don't get to have those images it's for the most part i, I don't know it's, it's part of my fundamental disconnect with sam shepherd sure. and, and his his weird like merging of realism and absurdism mm-hmm. that i just don't get i just don't i was like why are why are they basketball who cares <laughs> like, why, are, why are they talking about right. oddly get, specific yeah. Yeah. yeah like i get it and waiting for godot and they're like is that the sun or is that the moon and you're like oh we're just not even like we're in like purgatory or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And here it's like, why are we, what does the basketball have to do with anything? <laughs> is, uh, yeah, I think it is one of those things that like Sam Shepard loves props. Like the thing that like, I yeah, was, he's always thinking about the mm-hmm. stage and where people are. Yeah. The fact that you're hearing a voice. He's always thinking of like theatrical concepts and presentations. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's, it, it is like, it's very eye catching, right? The mm-hmm. thing yeah. that. The thing that you can take away from Sam Shepard's playwriting and apply it to your own is just like, what do you what what are you doing with the props? What does the tactile like environment look like? That that's yeah. sort of the main thing that like in playwriting classes like Sam Shepard is taught for you know all the themes or whatever, but also just very practically, what does your show look like? Mm-hmm. And wouldn't it be cool if there were like nine thousand of one thing on stage at a time? <laughs> yeah. Is mm-hmm. it corn? Is it carrots? Is it toasters? You know, like what what <laughs> what can be like a thing that like makes your play pop yeah. and. I think he's always very good about that, but it is only after going back, reading the script and actually like analyzing and thinking about it that I can come to any sort of conclusions about Buried Child. Because I'll be honest, I watched this for the first time. I've read it for the first time. and It's just not a play for me. It just doesn't. Mm -hmm. It's it's really dour and so much of it doesn't make sense, but not in a fun way that the characters can acknowledge like, well, that doesn't make any goddamn sense. You know, there's no fun in this. It is just a fucking dirge from like curtain up to curtain down. Well, I was I'm just reading the prop list here. I feel like, okay, so I feel like maybe the props and how specific they are. They're so ordinary too. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's obviously Mm -hmm. the corpse of child. That's not, you know, wooden leg. These are very (laughs) specific. Yeah, 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 but like glass of water. Um, you know, pale mm-hmm. like, pills, pill yeah, bottles, matches. I'm like, okay, specific, but you need these, I guess. Maybe it's like these um, little security things that the characters use to feel comfortable, or maybe mm-hmm. it's um, for us to. It's tools to bring us back to reality to keep it grounded in some kind of uh, very real, like this earth type of mm-hmm. scenario. And I guess it's also just if your identity is already decided for you or if you have any say in it at all. And what this family reminds me of is like, we'd like to think that, no, like I, I'm I'm making who I am on my own. I'm not tied to any sort of family history, but there's something about it. There's like a pull, there's like a gravitational pull that, you know, keeps bringing them back to this house and this idea. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess that's like a pretty common fear that I think a lot of people experience and um, the fact that the, they all stay in the house and Vince sort of taking the torch and mm-hmm. keeping it lit and now he's going to be in the house like well, sometimes when things are so horrible and you want to get out of there you still stay because it's like at least it's familiar mm-hmm. like yeah the yeah, unknown yeah. is way more scary sometimes so no matter how awful this reality that they have is they're stuck with it you know they're 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 loyal to this (laughs) horrible reality i don't know there is some kind of fucked up intimacy to it because it's like no one is abandoning each other it's like when bradley talks about the bond or not the bond uh the pact Mm-hmm. It is a bond, right? Yeah, it's yeah. Like, right. Because yeah. if one escapes, it's like leaving the rest to. So, like, I feel like that's almost the only way I see them 
expressing love for each right. other is like they're all going to be miserable together about this. Yeah. 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 And, and so that's kind of where Vince lands, too. Right. Yeah. Because once he's had the chance to get back and sit and dodge a seat and wear the hat, it's pretty clear that he's fucking not going anywhere. Yeah. He's going to he tells He tells Shelly to fuck off. Yeah. Dodge uh, dies. Yeah. And <laughs> it, with his last <laughs> breaths, he like recites his will and right. testament where he is going to bequeath absolutely everything to Vince. Right. And then he gives a total uh, inventory of all of his tools which he demands to like fuel his his funeral pyre. Right. Mm -hmm. You burn right. me on top of all of my tools in right, a big right, hole. Right. Cuz the farm is dead. The farm is not coming back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. what he, and what makes a man in America? What makes one of these yeah, his, his, his older work. generation? Your it is work. work. Your it is land. tools yeah. that yeah. he yeah. used yeah. House. and he wants yeah. that the things that he used to work to be destroyed mm -hmm. along See, with him. And this is where I think I would have connected with this play. It would have changed the whole thing if he just did some Tim Allen grunts. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh yes, men and their tools. It's like the oh, very it's tool time. <laughs> when, when, when he's getting his head shaved by Bradley, he just wakes up and goes, oh. <laughs> See, th this is oh, this is so my good. concept. In, in about ten years, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. going to approach Tim Allen. Perfect. And I'm gonna be like, hey. Yeah. Do you want to be on Broadway? Oh my god. I can make you a star, Tim. Yes. You don't even know. It's time. Yeah, come it's on. Time. It's time, Tim. Yes. Uh, but yeah, I, I guess the, it's Tim time. After <laughs> after all that happens, we get the closing image, which is uh Tilden comes back in. He walks up the stairs. And Tilden has been gone this whole act. Yeah, by he just the way. wanders yeah. back in, and he is carrying now the, the eraser head baby of yes. the buried child, the titular buried child. He's yep. going up the stairs to his mom. Maybe his mom is dead, dying? Question mark. Who knows? I think she's dying. But uh, but it, but then that's there's also like this sense that we're like hitting a reset button mm -hmm. where Vince is now Dodge, but she starts doing her thing. She's right. looking out the window and talking again. Yeah. But, yeah. but she sees the corn now. Yeah. Before she didn't see the corn mm -hmm. out in the backyard. Now she sees it. And I think my, my sense of that was like she was looking out the front window, mm -hmm. which is what she always does. And then she went across the hallway and oh. looked out the back window. Or that. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, and the play makes it very clear. This is their corn. Yeah. Corn has grown on their property. Yeah. Yeah. They Somehow did. corn returned. Magic. Magic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so I think, Yuri, I want you to read that last monologue from Hallie, if you can, to sort of okay. close out the play here. Dodge? Is that you, Dodge? Tilden was right about the corn, you know. I've never seen such corn. Have you taken a look at it lately? Dazzling. Tall as a man already. This early in the year. Carrots, too. Potatoes. Peas. It's like a paradise out there, Dodge. You ought to take a look. A miracle. I've never seen it like this. Maybe the rain did something. Maybe it was the rain. Good hard rain takes everything straight down deep to the roots. The rest takes care of itself. You can't force a thing to grow. You can't interfere with it. It's all hidden, unseen. You just gotta wait till it pops up out of the ground. Tiny little shoot. Tiny little white shoot. All hairy and fragile. Strong, though. Strong enough to crack the earth, even. It's a miracle, Dodge. I've never seen a crop like this in my whole life. Maybe it's the sun. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's the sun. Wow, Broadway really is back. Broadway's back. Broadway is <laughs> and we back. Brought, and we brought it back. We, we have. Brought, we sure have. I, may, you know what? Maybe it was brought, the sun. Broadway is mm. back. B-R-O-U-G-H-T-W-A-Y. Oh. Everyone's talking about back. it. Yeah. But the yeah. thing is, I think we're kind of at the end of our time now, aren't we? Yeah. So we see Tilden come back in from the backyard three times. First time he comes in with corn. Corn. Second time he comes in with a carrot. Right. The third time he comes in, is it? it is with the buried child. It's right. with the yeah. titular buried child. And what does he do with those vegetables when he brings them in. He shucks the corn. Mm -hmm. He takes off the outer layers of lies and reveals the truth at the center. 
He takes the carrots and he, along with Shelly, with mm-hmm. finally with Shelly's help, are able to whittle them down to what's at the bare bones. And at the end, he comes in with the fruit of their labor. He comes mm-hmm. in with this buried child. Tilden is sort of the harbinger of truth in this play. And even though Dodge is the one who reveals the sin, it is Tilden as a member of the older generation who comes in, who acknowledges the sin. Mm -hmm. And the play ends on a hopeful note because it's talking about the sun, talking Mm -hmm. about this big old crop, right? That's been revealed because the, the, the thing has finally been revealed, right? But Brian, you're right that the problem is that Vince is still on the fucking couch about to reenact all this bullshit all over again. It is a reset, right? So it is not Sam Shepard being like, oh, the future's so bright. Look at that crop out there. No, this is very ironic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it is that like the future is bleak and desperate, but it is important that the sin itself still be acknowledged. Yeah. Because it's the only possible way that anyone in the generation that came before can find any peace is to say Mm -hmm. out loud the thing. Well, here's what we'd like to say out loud. Yuri, thank you for coming on our show. (laughs) Oh my goodness, thank you so much for having me. This was so fun. I love this. I feel like this was good for my brain. Good. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Too much internet, not enough play absolutely yeah. that's you know we do we do plenty of both here on the worst of all possible worlds um if folks want to uh find you follow you whatever what should they do uh so my handle on social media is baby pink house house baby pink house <laughs> so yeah baby pink and h-a-u-s uh on tiktok instagram i do have x but i don't use it very often oh x the everything app yeah, the everything oh. app, you know. Just, I don't have anything to say. I'm just a girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I should have mentioned earlier. I have nothing to say. Okay, uh, you can't have you read Sam's Shepherd anymore. It's starting to affect you and your eh? <laughs> But yeah, you can find me there. Uh, I post um, on Instagram like my upcoming shows. I'm in New York right now. I'm going to be here till mid-May and then I'm going to be back in Tokyo doing stand-up comedy and also a play. I'm going to play Ooh. in July in right. Tokyo. It's in English. So if any listener oh, is in, yes, it's an English production of The Little Fellow by Kate Hamill. Cool. So mm. I'm excited about that. If any listeners out there are in Tokyo, please come check it out. It's I know we have a few of them. So yeah. Sheepdog Theater Productions, who very just cool. did Hamlet. And I saw oh, that. Cool. Yes, Ooh, it how was? It was great. Yeah, that's Ooh. why I got in the play. I like stuck around. Uh, I waited for the director to come out and I was like, hi, (laughs) when are your next auditions? And he was like, I thought you were a stand up comic. Like you want to do you want to act? I'm like, stop putting me in a box. No, You're a multi hyphenate. (laughs) God damn it. Like, come on. I'm trying to Ali Wong my way into the industry. (laughs) I'm I'm back Ali Wong. Uh, (laughs) So I'm trying to do that. So if you want to follow me and see what I'm up to, uh, it's usually on Instagram. Oh, yeah. Uh, we got the links, obviously, in the show notes, yeah. so check that out. Thank and you. Uh, what we also have is a Patreon where if you've enjoyed this and would love to hear more like it, patreon.com slash worst of all. That's where you can find it. If you liked this episode, you might like our episode about The Visit, uh, the Friedrich yeah. Dernmott play. That we did a while two ago. Years two years ago. ago. Yeah. Like, oh. If you've enjoyed sort of this approach of talking about plays, reading from the plays, stuff like that. Very similar episode where Brian headed that one up. Yeah. And, uh, and we also just world. had a premium episode about Slings and Arrows, That's which right. is about a TV show about theater. But, you know, we're, we're, we're just it's mostly theater. It's been a few weeks of theater here. We're theater. Uh, we're yeah, theater. Broadway is back. We're theater people. Broadway's back. We're theater kids. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening this week. So as we mentioned, Sam Shepard doesn't really have a lot of advice uh, for the future generations, right? Vince is kind of fucked because he has just been in, you know, sort of the the vicinity of the radioactive previous generations, that the masculinity has corrupted him because he looked back and stared too long into the Ark of the Covenant and his face melted, yep. <laughs> basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what, what was Sam Shepard kind of going for with this play? I think Shepard wants the greatest generation to acknowledge their sins because Mm. it is something they have pushed down and have buried in the earth for too, too long. And the way he goes about giving that advice is something that I think 
now that boomers can also take into account and be like reckoning with their own sins. But also when we as millennials reach that age to reckon with our own complicity. Yeah, we're our old enough sins. to be on Love Village. Yeah, we are. We sure are. <laughs> and to and to reckon with all the children that we have buried in our backyard. And he suggests this one bit of advice in an exchange between Tilden and Dodge in Act One. I don't want to talk about it. What do you want to talk about? I don't want to talk about anything. I don't want to talk about troubles or what happened 50 years ago or 30 years ago or the racetrack or Florida or the last time I seeded the corn. I don't want to talk, period. Talking just wears me thin. You don't want to die, do you? No, I don't particularly want to die either. Well, you gotta talk. Or you'll die. I'm the worst of all possible AJs. I'm the worst of all possible Brian's. And I'm the worst of all possible Josh's. See you next week. <laughs>